Everyone, if you so choose, please stand and remain standing as we give the pledge for our nation's flag. Thank you, Pastor M. You may proceed. Can I pray for us? Yes, sir. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are we first start want we want to start out by giving you thanks for you're a God that is good and we experience your grace and mercy each and every single day. So we thank you for that. Lord, we also want to claim a promise that you gave to Jeremiah long ago, that you have plans to bless us, plans not to harm us, plans to give us a hope in the future. And because you are the same God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we want to claim that promise for the city and all its people, that you have plans to bless us, to not harm us, to give us a hope and a future. Lord, we ask that um, all the workers of the city, the mayor, the councilmen, and the volunteers, and every individual involved, that your, your hand of blessing will be upon each one. Not only that, we ask that in the planning and uh, planning of this city, we ask that you guide the people involved. And Father, we pray for this meeting today that it will also be spirit-led and that ultimately uh, your goodness will be revealed through this meeting, Lord. Bless us and keep us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ian. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, Pastor M. May I have the roll call, please? <clears throat> Mayor Mouton? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Durio? Present. Councilmember Gitz? Absent. Councilmember Turner? Present. Councilmember Felshaw? Present. Councilmember Samuel? Present. And Councilmember Neal? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Today we have two presentations, and our first presentation is the Greater Belmont Chamber of Commerce Economic Development presentation. Would Mr. Steve Alanius please, President, CEO of the Chamber, please come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to make a presentation to you about economic development. I know it's a subject that is near and dear to everybody's heart. Uh, on this presentation I have up there in front of you is a picture of Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1969. Uh, in 1969, Chattanooga was losing population. They were losing businesses. Uh, they had a rising crime rate, and to top it all off, Walter Cronkite said it was the dirtiest city in America. Wow. That was a catalyst for that city to fast forward to today, and that picture on the right is a picture of Chattanooga, Chattanooga, Tennessee today. And so our challenge as leaders in this community is to see the invisible, to feel the intangible, and do the impossible. And we're going to have people tell us you can't do it, it's never been done, but as a word of encouragement, I want you to recognize that we can do it and we can be successful. Next slide, please. So we have what we're proposing in terms of what the core activities for economic development are. Number one, we've got to do a strategic plan. Without a strategic plan, we don't know where we're going what the outcomes are, or what the measurements are going to be. But part of that effort is also going to include marketing and business recruitment. That means bringing in new businesses to Beaumont. And then also business retention and expansion. And you will find that about 79% of business growth will come from your existing industries and existing businesses. Another component is small business uh, development and entrepreneurship, workforce development, obviously creating networks and partnerships. And then something that I think is gonna be critical for Beaumont is revitalization of corridors and that development that happens with that. Next slide. So I wanna kinda of give you just a real quick overview of some of the things that we're doing now and also are going to be launching in the near future. Obviously we're working with site selectors as they're looking at this community and as we work with different site selectors, site selectors, we have over 12 different 
industrial prospects in this community right now. We're also developing and maintaining a business uh, a site, a business site and buildings uh, database, along with uh, retention efforts with major industries in our community. We're going to be launching, uh, obviously, another big event we have coming up is the Industrial Trade Show, February 9th. And then we're also going to be launching the Greater, Economic, the Greater Beaumont Economic Pulse. One of the programs we're also launching is going to be our Focus on Business, where we profile uh, several high-impact uh, high industries in our community and also so, show appreciation for those. And then in small business development and entrepreneurship, uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit, I've talked to some of you about this, but the Growth and Expansion Fund for existing small <coughs> businesses, a Growth and Expansion Fund for minority-owned businesses, the First Step Innovation Grant Program, the 10X Business Mentoring Program that we're going to be launching in late March in the Inventors and Entrepreneurs Network that we're going to be long, launching in late March. Then also workforce development, and especially with a focus on youth development as a possibility. Next slide. So here are some of the current things that we're working on. You can see transportation and warehousing, uh, healthcare, petrochemical, green energy and carbon capture, which is emerging, uh, uh, strategic retail. And when I say strategic retail, I'm talking about retail businesses that are one, a one-off one that you're not going to find anyplace else. And then obviously petrochemical support industries, which has some great opportunities. Now, what I'm suggesting here is just thoughts. These are these are opportunities out there, but I think doing a strategic plan, I think, is going to give us a better indication of what those opportunities are. But here's just some thoughts. So uh, transportation innovation, self-driving trucks is really starting to emerge as a, po a potential. Geotechnical and oil refining is another area, uh, especially with the IRA Act, the in Infrastructure Reinvestment Act. I think there's going to be some opportunities there. Robotics and automation system is another one. Life science and innovation, and I'm not talking about medical equipment, but we're talking about processes, kind of the, down the pipeline type things. International business continues to be a great opportunity for this community. And then using what I call tactical urbanism, that is doing quick, easy events where there can be success and can show success for the community, and then developing key corridors. I think that's a strategy as we look. There could be a technology corridor. There could be a medical corridor. And you develop those things and those projects based on incentives, tax abatement, and programs designed to attract those type of businesses or those industries to a specific corridor. Next slide. So as we've been, as we've been talking with different folks and trying to get their input, one of the things that we asked, and this was, this was just kind of a, a brainstorming session that we held, but one of the, you know, I'm, just, I'm not going to go through all those, but some of the key things that I think you need to hear and would love to have your comments on was obviously diversification, uh, the infrastructure that we have in terms of rail, pipeline, highways, and the airport, and the port, uh, wanting to protect the existing industries that we have here and make sure that we promote and, and protect those. But then also looking at a you know, re redevelopment for downtown and also just the opportunities to be pro-business in terms of what we do as far as a community. And then the final section on this, this is really kind of where the ask is. Uh, for us to move forward, there's a couple of things that we need from the city. The first one would be uh, finding and hiring a consultant to do a strategic plan. And we're looking at approximately seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars for that. And the next part of that would be fifty thousand dollars to do the f growth and expansion funds and the first step innovation uh, program, which I think are really kind of fits that concept of urban uh, uh, tactical urbanism, where you do stuff that's quick, easy, and quick victories for the community. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you had. Uh, when I talked to Kenneth about this, said you had 10 minutes. <laughs> so make sure you stay within your 10 minutes. But I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions or comments? Council Member Getz. Steve, I apologize for my tardiness. Could you elaborate a little bit on the growth and expansion grant uh, and how that would? Uh, 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the growth and expansion grant would be a $15,000 grant that, and I'm proposing this as a pilot project that we would open up to uh, Beaumont businesses to allow them in a, basically a competition, almost like Shark Tank, but I refer to it as Dolphin Tank, where there would be a panel of judges, they would do a business plan, they would compete, and whoever had the best idea in terms of kind of growing their market share or adding jobs would end up being the winner. We would do that project where we wouldn't actually pay them the money, it would be third party pay in which we would pay perhaps their vendor or somebody where they wanted to get software developed for their business or an inventory done for their business that we paid them the, the uh, contractor or supplier directly. It doesn't go directly into that person's hands. So it's a good way to kind of protect the money to make sure it's going for what it's intended to do. Did you, did you say 15 or 50? 15, one five. One okay. Five. And, and again, council member, it's, it's a demonstration <coughs> project. It's, again, that tactical urbanism, something that you can do quick, have a success. And I think, and I, and I really believe that the success of this program would come back, and I think the city council would be very, very favorable to doing it. The, the reason I asked is it says 50. On that, this. That's 50,000 for both the, the innovation, I mean, for the innovation grant program, the growth and expansion fund and the minority growth and expansion fund. So that's the. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Turner. Well, Steve, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for the presentation. I think it's extremely important when we talk about economic development. I think the city, we always say we lean on the chamber to do economic development, but 85,000 is not that much you can actually get done with that price. So I thank you for putting together a proposal. Uh, and the most important thing, I thank you for doing little things to get the community involved and engaged with the process and coming with a strategic plan because similarly to what you said, if we don't know where we're going, how we're gonna get there. So I thank you for taking the time out, doing the presentation, and I know this is something I'm in support of. Thank you, Councilman. Anyone else? Councilman Felshaw. Steve, again, thank you for your passion for our city and your presentation. Uh, this growth and expansion grant for small businesses, I'm assuming you've seen this done other places and you've seen their success rate. I, I've done it in other places, yes, sir. Uh, we used a bigger fund where I came from, uh, about 400000 But uh, I, I think for, for your comfort level as elected officials, I think using it as a demonstration project for you get to see it up, up close and personal before we expand it and to use that success story to then to grow, the, grow the program. But I think it can be very successful. So your confidence level at this being successful is pretty high? Yes, sir. Thank you. Council Member Sammy. With the growth and expansion grant for the small businesses, have you looked at targeted areas in which those will be utilized? No, sir. And, and what we do is that I think that's really up to the panel of judges. Um, but you, what you want to do is find those businesses that have a passion to grow their, their, their company, their small business, and who have a really good idea to do it. And sometimes they just need a little, what I call goosing, you know, just a little extra gas in the gas tank to get there. And I think this program can do it. But to your point about corridor development, I think that is where in a bigger strategic plan for economic development that we can look at corridor development and what we can do to incentivize and bring about growth and development in specific corridors. Will you all be looking at the existing enterprise zones that have been established already? That could be a, that could be a huge factor in terms of what's being done, yes, sir. Well, Steve, thank you so very much you, uh, for a great presentation. I wanna say uh, last night at the Neighborhood Association meeting, uh, most of these um, points that you've um, put in this presentation were questions that were asked last night. Yeah. So thank you so very much. Yeah. We appreciate there, it. There, there's great opportunities, Mayor. And, it is. And I know there's, there's going to be folks who say it can't be done, but I promise you, we can get it done together. If so. you've done it before, you could do it here. Yeah, we, we have we faith can do it, in you. We can do it here. Thank you. Thank sir. you. Well, at this time, we have another presentation, but before I announce the next presentation, I will ask if everyone will please silence your cell phones. And I'll give you just a few seconds to do that because we've had two to go off already. And while we're doing that, I wanna also acknowledge uh, our former mayor, Mayor Ames is in the audience and also 
school board member, Mr. Stacy Lewis Jr. Thank y'all for attending today. Okay, at this time, our second presentation is a presentation by Mr. John Mata, who is the Director of Field Services with the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials. Mr. Mata, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. I am John Mata, Senior Director of Field Services for the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, commonly referred to as IAPMO. I also hold a journeyman plumber's license with Texas, issued by the Texas State Board of Plumbing Examiners. We appreciate the time you've given us here today for the opportunity to address uh, the Plumbing and Mechanical Codes, the 2021 Uniform Plumbing and Uniform Mechanical Codes, which are the prescriptive and most widely used codes in the plumbing industry today. IAPMO was founded in 1926 as a development organization and continues to be utilized throughout Texas and the country. The uniform codes are routinely cited as versatile, clear and concise, easy to apply documents. The Uniform Plumbing Code and Uniform Mechanical Code are the only and uh, plumbing and mechanical codes to receive an ANSI designation as an American national standard. How can Beaumont benefit from the Uniform Codes? The Uniform Plumbing and Mechanical Code allow Beaumont to easily tailor their plumbing and mechanical codes to best meet local needs. No other model plumbing and mechanical code has a volume of appendices that are offered in the Uniform Codes. The Uniform Mechanical Code has 12 optional appendices and the Uniform Plumbing, 14. IABMO offers support and training for Beaumont and surrounding communities, such as code answers, analysis, interpretations, that are free to every, anyone, not just members, through IATMO's toll-free request line. Cost savings. The Uniform Plumbing Code is a cost-effective plumbing code due to its inclusion of the water demand calculator, a new piping sizing tool that can save thousands of dollars in construction costs. The Uniform Plumbing Code allows flexibility for both riser and tenant valves on multifamily buildings. Other model codes require a tenant valve for each unit. Their thereby raising the overall construction costs. Bottom line, the cost savings for the industry and homeowners. The uniform codes integrate seamlessly with all model building codes. They exceed minimum regulations. Enforcement is simplified because there are few areas of interpretation. Therefore, uh, the rule book is the same for both the tradesperson and the inspector. Advanced provisions to maximize cost savings can approve, improve housing affordability. The new water demand calculator that we talked about in the appendices, Appendix M, in the 2021 Uniform Plumbing Code is a new tool that determines pipe sizes in accordance with today's lower flow rate plumbing fixtures and appliances. They result in savings on water, energy, and material costs, which are beneficial to the homeowners and the, the builders. <laughs> the first significant update for this water pipe size is in buildings in nearly a century. They haven't been updated since the 1940s. The cost savings on construction of a home can be as high as 5,000 for a single family home and, is, and easily exceed 100,000 for multifamily home buildings or apartments. No other plumbing code utilizes these innovation and cost savings. Our advantages in the mechanical code include geothermal energy systems, hydronics, fuel gas price uh, piping. Other mechanical codes send the user to a separate document for fuel gas provisions and also have provisions for manufactured mobile homes and parks. In conclusion, both the uniform plumbing and mechanical codes correlate seamlessly with all model building codes. These are the industry's preferred codes by the Beaumont plumbing contractors and mechanical contractors, as well as industry. These codes maximize resiliency and best address local needs through the optional appendices. Offers, uh, they offer co cost savings to Beaumont that cannot be found in other model codes. And I ask uh, the council to please consider uh, in for, in for the future adoption, we respectfully request the adoption of the 2021 Uniform Plumbing and Mechanical Code uh, when that agenda item may come up. And I 
I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Right. Council Member Getz. Can you contrast some of the differences between the Uniform Mechanical and Plumbing Code and the International Code that I believe we currently use? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the one would be the number of books. And you have six books that you can use for the international just on the, let's just say plumbing alone, let's take plumbing, as opposed to six, I mean one for the uniform, one book, all provisions, gas, everything in one book. That's a cost savings alone in the city alone instead of having to purchase these multiple books, like, like I said, gas provisions. In the international, you have the international plumbing. If you have to go to gas, you have to buy the international fuel gas code. If you need your venting for your like your water heater, you got to go to the International Mechanical Code. Separate books. In the plumbing industry, being a plumber for over 30 years, it's hard to get anybody to look at one book, much less multiple books. But I've got a little graph here that shows six books to one. That's the main thing. The other one is our prescriptive nature, clear and concise. The plumbers in the industry want clear and concise provisions, point A to point B. And that's what we're, our prescriptive nature of our code. The international allows for interpretation. That can be a nightmare, especially in code enforcement department. If you have a contractor has two jobs, north south side and south side of Beaumont, one could get interpreted differently than the other job. And that's very cumbersome for the industry, and the plumbers, and the code enforcement department. And I guess the biggest, uh, if I can, uh, councilman, the biggest is that water demand calculator. Like I said, it's never been updated since 1947. And we were the first ones to do it. It took us almost eight years to do it from 2012, uh, six years of 2018. And we finally got it done. We've got it approved. And it's been in our 2018 and our 2021 code now and will go further. And I'll be, be honest with you, the, no, the international doesn't have it. What kind of calculator is that? It's a water demand calculator to calculate peak water demand sizing. A lot of times uh, pipes are oversized. Mm -hmm. And when you can get in that, those of you that are – have been in the, the, anybody knows construction, impact fees for water meters. Instead of using a three-quarter meter, you can go down to a, a five-eighths meter, and that's thousands and thousands of dollars on home building, residential building. So, Mr. Mata, you yes. would say that um, converting to this new code would be uh, a savings to residents and, and home builders? And, 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 and the commercial. home builders and the plumbers, yeah. Because, it, it, yes, ma'am, okay. so it would be. Council Member Gates. Mayor, will we have the opportunity to uh, hear any opposing views as to why the uh, international code might be better, or is there anybody advocating for that, or, you know, wh where are we on that? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Council Member uh, Neal. Thank you, Mayor. And I can kind of speak to a little bit of that. You know, I've uh, supported the uniform code for, <coughs> I guess, Jeremy Pavlich and I have talked about this for the last couple of years with you. Um, a couple requests I would like to make before we move forward with this is having some type of presentation that's done by you guys with the city uh, to organizations like the AGC and the Home Builders Association, just so we're not blindsiding those guys with it. Uh, one of the other requests, back to comment, Councilman Getz made is uh, can we hear city staff's uh, concerns or recommendations on this and kind of get their thought process? Uh, yes, we have a meeting planned with Mr. Mata tomorrow to discuss this, and we haven't had the opportunity yet to do that. So after that meeting, we can come back and give a report to council on comparisons, things that the uh, staff have, has observed, or um, just give you an idea of. What, what they, how they compare. One other comment, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to talk to probably 15 different plumbing companies over the last couple of weeks on this item, and I haven't had any negative on it yet. On the on adopting the new code? No negative against it, against adopting this new code. Council Member Turner. Yeah, I kind of want to say I myself have had the privilege of talking to a lot of local and that and other plumbing companies, including city council members that live in Houston, has already adopted these codes. So and they said it's been very productive and it's better for the home builders and commercial property builders. But 
on a second note, I kind of want to speak to interpretation because a lot of times when we as city council members get phone calls, it's simply because, you know, staff interprets it one way and they see it another way and we're stuck in the middle trying to help figure it out. With, the, with respecting staff, but all at the same time understanding the investor or the builder has an issue as well. So I think interpretation is a big issue when it comes to getting things done. I think something that's simply point A to point B that can't be interpreted interpreted would be very beneficial for the city as well as the investor or builder. So that's been an issue that i kind of been stuck in the middle a few times with, and I just think that would help both sides. So I like that. I agree. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, Mr. Mata, thank you so very much for your presentation, and we look forward to getting um, the information and the results from your meeting okay. on thank tomorrow. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mayor. Due to the weather and the long process of the 50 items that we have on the agenda, we're going to move public comments and um, we're going to move it up so that citizens that would just like to make a pu public comment if they need to leave that you could go ahead and leave because we have again 50 structures on um, the agenda for today and so we want to make sure that uh, we move as efficient and proficient as we can due to the weather so uh, at this time, I'm going to read executive session. At the close of the city council meeting, the council will hold an executive session to consider matters related to contemplate or pending litigation in accordance with section 551.071 of the government code, the claim of Henry Moore, the claim of Michael Murray, the claim of First Fleet, Tori Frazier versus City of Beaumont, Cause number E-206919 and Robert Cooley versus City of Beaumont. Cause number 0137252. At this time, I will open the floor for public comment. Now is the time for any citizen who wish to speak. If you haven't already done so, fill out the green slip to the back of the room, hand it to the clerk to the right of the, of the uh, room. Um, she will call your name when it's time for you to speak. And do you have any? Yes, ma'am. Before you begin, <coughs> Mayor, are you also allowing people to speak on the consent agenda and items 1 through 11? I was going to include them. I'm sorry. Also consent uh, agenda. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Um, Addie Allen, 9695 Grove Street, Beaumont, Texas. Um, she's wanting to speak on um, items D and F on the consent agenda and items number 7 and 8 on the regular agenda. Say D and F. Yes, ma'am. On the you. consent agenda. Good afternoon, uh, City Manager, Mr. City Manager, Mayor, Councilman, and all other officials. Um, I'm standing here today, um, and I'll try to do three minutes real quick. Uh, on the uh, consent agenda, we can do all each one of the comments now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. On the consent agenda, I made a statement on the 10th. And ask, or I ask a question whether the city was insured or self-insured. The notes um, reflect that I said underinsured. I also made a comment whether we had a public assistance program, and that's not reflected in the notes. On D, the city manager entered into a contract with Legacy. My question is, I didn't know that we had funds for housing. Is that strictly? for development corporations, or is the citizens uh, privy to getting those funds for repairs or renovation? Um, and it showed that $279,000 was going to legacy. So is that handled by staff or is strictly through contract? And then on <coughs> F, um, the mutual aid, I was, really kind of concerned. Um, I know that you had a meeting last year where you met with P uh, BISD and you're going from <laughs> quarterly to two a year. Our children are our best resources. And even if there's nothing on the table, 
uh, unlike other states where there are shootings and all that kind of stuff, if it's just safety, um, I'm just concerned that you would get with BISD more often than it's two times a year. Um, that's just personal how I feel. And then um, the number seven, uh, and I guess this, Mr. City Manager, goes with uh, your strategic plan, but just question whether, if this is approved today with Evergreen, um, how far or wide will you go with the compensation study? Um, will that mean that now you'll have staff to readjust salaries and make sure that we're on point and actually on point with like cities? Um, so that's a question that I have. But more or less, um, I thank you for your service. And um, one concern I have is over on um, Major Drive, there's a railroad track that intersects McLean. And it has gotten in, I mean, terrible shape where when we travel, and of course there's a school there as well, there's a rail uh, that's coming up which is damaging our cars. Thank you for your time and have a good day. Thank you. Ivory North, <clears throat> 5261 Sunset Avenue, Beaumont, Texas. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, I appreciate being here, being here and I felt very warm when I uh, came in, but um, I have a concern. I live in South Park, and South Park is a second home for myself and my husband. And we have three properties, um, which is 5375, 5395, and 5261 Sunset. Um, I've reached out many, many times to uh, code enforcement to make them aware that um, the properties are unsecure, um, the grass is not being cut, they're not being maintained. <clears throat> and so pretty much what I'm getting is the department heads, they're out running errands on city time and that they are, they're non-responsive. And um, I just think, you know, as a taxpayer, that's just not even professional. It's not even acceptable, you know? And I ask, so how often <coughs> do you guys come out and monitor the neighborhood. And the response I get is, we're really busy. Um, we don't have any type of schedule, you know, and um, I ask for return phone calls or emails. It, it doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, at a minimum, you know, we all want our values of our property to be maintained. You know, we, we want to feel safe when we go into our home. Um, and, um, I, and I just think, you know, that's not asking too much. And so I'm just here to ask you guys to help me with my issues. And so, um, Mayor, Ms. Robin, who is our city council person uh, for that community now? Mr. Durio is. Hello there. And I think I did send you an email um, a, a couple of uh, weeks ago, and um, I was in, you know, and I was hoping to get some feedback um, to see where we are because, you know. Um, are you going <laughs> to stay for the whole meeting? Yes, sir. Okay. Can I speak to you after the meeting? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miss North. Mm -hmm. Joshua and I. I think this is Holub, I'm not sure. Um, 4828 Pine Avenue, Pasadena, Texas. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Joshua Holub, and I'm the owner of Modern <coughs> Plumbing Company. Uh, I'm here to speak in support of the 2021 uh, Uniform Plumbing and Mechanical Codes. Um, <coughs> Our industry was built around these codes, and <coughs> these are the only codes that continue to grow with the industry, but for the end user. Um, much of the much of our business uh, includes chemical plants, refining plants, um, uh, just 
a lot of plant services and including those support uh, <coughs> services as well. Um, we service over 75 of those, uh, including some here in Beaumont, uh, also the Coca-Cola uh, bottling plant as well. Um, all of which, if our company is involved, are being built and remodeled and, um, and repaired using the standards that are outlined in the uh, Uniform Plumbing Codes. And the reason that we do is we feel that um, because our industry was built around these, this creates a, a more serviceable system. The longevity is much better. Uh, again, um, to the, the first uh, presentation that you guys all saw, as you guys continue to grow, your infrastructure is going to have to grow as well. Um, by reducing the, use of, the usage in water uh, through that water demand calculator, it's going to decrease the cost for that infrastructure, um, uh, you know, to, uh, for that expansion of your infrastructure use. So uh, this is something that's going to be huge for the, the city of Beaumont. And so I appreciate what the city of Beaumont has done for our business. And uh, I hope that you guys will consider it and, uh, and move towards it. So it, it would be good for the citizens of Beaumont. And uh, Mayor Mouton and Council, thank you all for your time. We appreciate you guys. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> John Diaz, uh, 1635 West Lucas, Beaumont, Texas. Good afternoon. Hello. My name is John Damien Diaz. My home address is 1635 West Lucas. I graduated from John J. French High School in 1985. Go Buffaloes. I have been a resident of Beaumont for most of my 57 years, except for a four-year enlistment in the United States Air Force between 1986 and 1990, and then a few years in San Antonio and Corpus Christi. Beaumont is my home. As a lifelong resident of Beaumont, I have a vested interest in this city, its schools, its businesses, and hospitals, both old and new. There's a difference there now. My wife and I have owned and operated our small plumbing business, Beaumont Plumbing, since 2006. I've been a licensed journeyman plumber since 1999 and a responsible master plumber since 2005. <sighs> when I first started in the plumbing industry, most of the projects I was involved with were mostly new commercial construction, state and federal prisons, hospitals, schools, universities, here in Beaumont and in the Golden Triangle area. After a five-year apprenticeship program, I ended up with my journeyman license, and then finally a master license, and then owning my own business. I found myself and my crew working mostly on homes and businesses that were between 30 and 50 years old at the time. Now, some of those homes and businesses are anywhere between 50 and 80 years old, and many of them much, much older, including the plumbing and the structures themselves. The materials and fixtures and install, and I'm sorry, the plumbing materials, fixtures, and installation has changed noticeably in the last 20 years. Water lines at one time could be found to be galvanized pipe, PVC, CPVC, copper, and in some cases, lead pipe. Lead pipe water lines. Waste and vent piping could be lead pipe, galvanized copper, PVC, cast iron, and in some cases, still concrete and clay pipe. The plumbing industry has changed dramatically. New plumbing fixtures have been made more efficient, uh, for better or for worse, in some cases, drastically more complex. I'm going to give you an example. A 40-gallon gas water heater tank type requires a cold water supply, a hot water line for a point of use, metal bestest vent pipe and natural gas supply, along with clearances requirements uh, for high temperatures and carbon monoxide gases. Now, take into consideration a new natural gas tankless water heater. The PVC vent system instead of metal bestest, condensation drains, 120 volt power source, larger natural gas supplies, remote control panels, with clearance requirements. It comes down to this. Newer equipment, newer fixtures, newer appliances needs a newer code. The 2021 UPC Plumbing Code. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Diz, and thank you for uh, your service to our country. Sam March Marchand, 640 Kennedy, Beaumont, Texas. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. My name is Sam Marchand. I serve on the Beaumont Youth Advisory Council and was selected by them to be the liaison to the City Council. For the first time, youth in Beaumont now have a platform to speak up for actual positive change, not just platitudes or lofty statements, but actual concrete progress. It is my sincere hope that we can begin to undo the decades-old mantra of stagnation and decline in Beaumont and that a robust Youth Advisory Council can show that young people here have a bright and vibrant future and that the city is finally making good on its duty to invest in that future. It's my intent to help the council make good on its purpose, to harness the value and power of Beaumont's <clears throat> greatest resource, its youth. So far, we've tackled important issues plaguing the city from crime, homelessness, to the dilapidated downtown area. Over the next semester, we hope to be a source of critical youth input for the city council and others, providing unique insight and perspective that only um, youth can give. I wish to close with a quote from the great Theodore Roosevelt. The government is us, and we are the government. Beaumont is its youth, and it is the mission of the Youth Advisory Council to show that it is the youth who are the bedrock of Beaumont. Thank you very much, and I very much look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Morshan. Charlie Crabb, 928 East Drive, Beaumont, Texas. This is just public comment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hello, Mayor. How are you, Council, Mr. Crabb? Staff. Uh, it's a nice day to be uh, down at City Council today with <laughs> <laughs> wind blowing outside. Uh, uh, one thing uh, that came up, I think, last meeting, uh, I, I, I like uh, uh, Councilman Getz's comments about the buses, trying to economize on buses, and I sure support him for uh, doing that. I, I, I enjoy seeing the smaller buses that run around Beaumont, they look nice, and hopefully they're comfortable inside. Uh, let's see, there was one other thing I had in mind, but it, it doesn't uh, come right now, but thank you all for your service, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Mr. Crabb. Whenever you want to take a ride on one of those new buses, I'll pay for it, okay? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I'm Jeremy Pavlich, 8596 Rice Drive, Beaumont, Texas. I'm sorry, Lumberton, Texas. Sorry, Jeremy. Well, good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and City Staff. Uh, Jeremy Pavlich, Master Plumber for Mid County Plumbing. It brings me great pleasure to see the city that I love once again publicly show support for an industry that is very dear to me plumbing. I say once again because there was a time where this city and a lot of you who were elected council members stood by the plumbing industry during the 86th legislative session and helped plumbers across Texas continue to strengthen the trade. I was up to my chin in that fight and when I looked around to see the support I had during that session I remember friends like IATMO, Plumbers Local 68, the PHC, see, and my hometown. The city of Beaumont sent our plumbing inspector to testify right by my side to our state senators and state representatives. They went on public record and took a stance that we needed licensed plumbing in the great state of Texas. I appreciate you who fought the good fight, and I, once again, I'm here to witness the city moving to find ways to straighten and support the plumbing industry. The UPC is the gold standard of the plumbing code and is used all across the world even in the materials and the fixtures that we all use. I and the majority of plumbers who go through an apprenticeship program am thoroughly trained in the UPC. It's because it tells you exactly how to plumb from A to Z, and you can use it anywhere. That cannot be said about the other code. This is what I taught in the plumbing school during my career as an instructor here in Beaumont, in which the mayor, and a lot of you have witnessed firsthand, and you're welcome to come back anytime. IATMO gave us our code books and resources at no cost because they are here not to sell books, but here to fortify our plumbing industry. 
I wear my Atmo shirt today because it reminds me of another time when then Councilwoman Mouton, along with Councilman <laughs> Turner and Neil, and the late and esteemed W.L. Pate joined us on a project known as Safer Water for Nome. Your council put in the time to get a better understanding of water quality so that they could adequately plan for this city's future. So I'm going to wrap this up by simply saying thank you from all of us. Your support will always be remembered, and we will always be here when you need us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And that's all that I have, Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, I'll call for a motion for the consent agenda. May I have a motion, please? So move, move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? No discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Mayor, I'm sorry, I have one more. That's okay. I was waiting. I'm sorry, I have two more sure. for public comments. My apologies. No can problem. Can we go back? I'm sorry. Can we? we you can go back. Okay. James Eller, 38, is that 87 East Lucas? 3587 East Lucas, Beaumont, Texas. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm here for my demolition uh, or nuisance on my home, which that's another topic, uh, but I do want to dive into it for a second whenever I talk as my second part of this. So uh, November 7th of 2022, I brought up the topic at the Special Joint City Council and BISD meeting about body worn cameras that B B uh, BPD wears. Uh, we have a majority black council which is four votes against three and a seven. We have a now black city manager. We have a now black city attorney. I'm looking for the city to push for the protection of young black youth in our city, which is now 48% black, 31% white. That's the majority of the city and they're not being protected. I've seen handcuffed teenagers and young adults being pushed down to the ground and abused by BPD. And I would like to have the city of Beaumont release that like many other departments around Texas, around the US, to be able to see these officers and point out the good officers from the bad officers. Remove the bad officers that steadily abuse our citizens. We need to remove them and put back, remove that stigma we need to uplift the BPD officers that do well. We need to get rid of the ones that do uh, bad. We're talking about hiring new BPD officers, but if we're gonna hire them into a force, this is gonna continue the same practices of even myself being beat by San Miguel that put a bullet through his own head. So the guy committed suicide. That's the type of individual <coughs> we're not getting rid of. So let's move on to number two. So houses and properties are not being governed the same under the same code so we have building code officers that come out and they enforce building code per the way that they want to do or per the way that citizens want to call in certain properties we know employees of the city of beaumont drive past all of these vacant properties uh let's say even uh Flanagan's Junk Museum over on MLK that has car bumpers hanging over the fence all the way from the ground all the way past the building roof line. I see another property he has over on, uh, I think it's 3380 um, Quinn, 3385 Quinn that has bumpers, car parts, everything on the fence all down the block. However, if I investigate that property, I bet you I can't find any kind of removal or any kind of deals done with the city to enforce him to get into compliance. Same thing, MLK, there are none. There are no red tags, there's no health code violations, there are no trash removals, there's nothing. So we're holding citizens to a different standard <coughs> per. We have the Henchy House that is, has floors completely gutted where a chimney fell through and knocked out floors. It's supported, and I got pictures right here. I got pictures of it having floors ripped down, hold, held up by two by fours, yet we're condemning people's homes and we're allowing this no red tag, a work program that's been in place <coughs> of 2015 till now. Thank you, Mr. Eller. I wish Eller. everybody was judged the same. Thank you. Um, James, I think it's Callius, 5375 Rosemary Drive, Beaumont, Texas. 
Greetings to the mayor and to the council and active staff. I am James Callis. I've been in Beaumont all my life, and I'm not here. I am a master plumber. I have been since 1984. I'm here because I'm also on the agenda twice. I have, I had three red tag houses. I'm happy to report I now have two. With the help of Delancey Wood, 4615 Magnolia received a certific certificate of occupancy, and Mr. Gomez is living in that house, and I was very happy to get that finished. That was a lot of, a lot of pressure. I'm here at this moment on the, uh, just on uh, the public comment to tell that the city, uh, during the freeze, I was driving somewhere and I saw a bus that said warming station. I want to let you know I was extremely proud of the city. I heard later it was Councilman Fesshaw. I was attending the homeless co coalition at the time. Many people complimented the city. We want to be proud of our city at all levels, at all times. I know that's not possible. You know, we, we're a diverse population and um, we've lost a lot of population. I'd like to have the growth come back, but basically my public comment is compliments to all. All the city staff that I've been dealing with have been very helpful. No one's been condescending. They hold me to the rules. I expect them to do that. And I'll be talking again, I assume, during the agenda for my 2485 Magnolia and Amia's house for homeless women and for the stuff that's accumulated where I live. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. City Manager, may I have the reading of item number one, please? Yes, Mayor. <clears throat> item number one. <clears throat> Council consider approving an ordinance calling the general general election for May 6, 2023 to elect the mayor two council members at large and four <coughs> ward council members one each for ward one two three and four and approving a runoff election if necessary on june 10th 2023 city charter dictates that all elected officials be elected on a regular election day established by the election code of the state of texas the city of beaumont is designating the first saturday of may to, to conduct this election and will will conduct a joint election with the Beaumont Independent School District and the Port of Beaumont. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number one. May I have a motion, please? Move, Move to, to approve the resolution. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? Council Member Turner and Council Member Getz. Uh, just a, a few questions for clarity to the community. I noticed on Monday through Monday through Saturday, April 24th through the 29th, our polls are open from 8 o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. I've had multiple citizens <laughs> ask, you know, due to the fact that people work 8 to 5, is it a reason we don't extend it to 9 to 6? So, Ms. Clerk, can you kind of speak to that? Well, the Secretary of State's office um, dictates our times that our polls can be open, and so that's why we have those 8 to 5, and then the last two days of early voting are from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and then on Election Day again, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay. I told citizens I would ask that question, so I wanted to make sure I asked it. The second question that I noticed is on Sunday, and most cases in the past, I've known there's been pews to the polls and polling locations are opened on Sundays. Is the particular reason or how long have we been away from polling locations being open on Sundays? If memory serves me correct, I think 2017 may have been the last time, <clears throat> excuse me, that we had polls open on a Sunday. Uh, we had a meeting with the county clerk at that time. It was Ms. Carolyn Guidry. We didn't have uh, the kind of turnout that we normally had when we started opening on Sundays. It seemed like it dwindled. And we found that we were paying more poll workers to work the polls than we had citizens that came out to vote. So when we did our next election, we decided that it just was not feasible for us to pay poll workers to work and we weren't having the turnout now. However, if you know we wanna try that again, absolutely we can you know try to open the polls on Sundays again and see how it works. And of course we only open the polls on Sunday from 12 o'clock until 5, 5 p.m. And, and lastly, Mary, this election is between the city the school district and the port. 
Have we got f- feedback from those entities on where they stand with Sundays? Uh, we don't know. It is my understanding. I think there was some conversation and maybe a meeting that will be held in the future, maybe in, in the next week or so, that the school district is wanting to bring the Sunday back. So that's something that we'll meet with the county clerk and meet with their office and everybody can come to an agreement to see whether or not we want to revisit that. My last one, Mary, if, if we did decide to move forward today and this meeting comes out and they want to open it up on Sundays, would this affect us if we voted on this today? We can ask our legal. You would just have to do an amendment? Yes. We can just go back and add Sunday and then just, yeah. you know, council can, can uh, vote on it again. It'd just be a resolution amendment. We do those all the right. time. No further questions, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Getz. At the uh, school board meeting that you referenced, uh, Ms. Broussard, there was also some comments made about changing a polling location, I think, from the municipal airport to a different uh, location. Right. Uh, what, where is that new location and what prompted that? I will have to talk with the county clerk. I know we talked about that and discussed it in a meeting that I had with them a couple of weeks ago. And so um, I need to talk with, with them and see if we've come up with an alternative polling location. Councilman Getz, I believe it was the municipal airport wasn't available right. during those times. Right. So that, that was the, the concept. And I think, I believe that Westbrook was, pr- was proposed. But then that's been removed as well. So, so yeah. Westbrook was proposed, but there, there was a conflict because we weren't able or wouldn't do, th- wouldn't do Beaumont United and Westbrook both. And the reason for not doing Beaumont United was because we had the library um, within walking distance of the two polling locations. Right. And so we didn't feel like that was necessary. So we've had polling take place at Amelia Elementary in the past, which is close to Westbrook. Uh, is that something that could be considered? We did. We talked about Amelia, so we may go back to Amelia Elementary. Yes, we okay. did talk about that as well. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Duria. So any of these changes made, we picked other polling locations, we could all come, do we have to come back and vote on that also or just on the dates? Well, so any changes that are made to the resolution um, that affect any of the other parties that could potentially affect the resolution will come back and be amended with the amended resolution. And it's also being approved by the county um, commissioners. And so a lot of times if the county commissioners approve it as long as council's good with those polling locations, then we don't have to. But if you guys want us to come back and bring it back to you after we kind of settle on what locations we'll use, then we can absolutely do that. And I just want to say I would support that voting on Sundays because that's something that we've historically done opposed to the pews of, pews to the polls are very popular. I think that was something to be good to come back with. Yes. Thank you. Any other comments? No other comments? Tina, next week, if possible, when you guys meet, can you just come back and <laughs> At least email council and give us an update of the meeting because I'm in support of the Sunday polling as well. Absolutely, yes, sir. That was my plan. As soon as we meet, I will update everybody, including the city manager and the city attorney, as to what we discuss and what we come up with. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Council council member gets. Thank you, ma'am. Is uh, the voting on Sunday a decision that is made by the county clerk's office, made by the various entities, or or how does that work? It would be the entities that are involved. It would be our decision whether or not we want to bring Sunday back. So if the port's okay with it and the city's okay with it, which it sounds like, and you are, uh, we can bring it, we can go ahead and add Sunday from 12 to 5. Just to be clear, that's an economic decision, not necessarily like a voting. Like the, the decision was because it was, you know, those parties share the cost of the election. Right. So that that's why that decision is based solely on the parties, how much they want to, you know, how much they're budgeted for that election. So it's not a, it's not a county thing. It's just. Could, when you say it's an economic decision, can somebody give us an idea of how much money we're talking about? So uh, if you're poll workers per location. Yes. So, I mean, I think each location has roughly about seven to ten poll workers on average, mm-hmm. give or take, or five That's to seven. That's in the, if we have like a, um, 
county election, but when we have a city election, we don't normally. So it's, it's like the three. It's or four. a little bit less. You might have maybe six people working, maybe four. You know, two to check in and two to work the machines. And only for five hours. Yes, on Sunday. Yes, sir. And we could possibly, depending on foot traffic, we could possibly look at what polling locations or early voting locations that we might have more foot traffic and, and have more people there versus other locations. We might only want to have three people. It just depends on the location and the foot traffic. And so that's something we'll look at as well. Thank you. Councilmember Neal. Oh, thank you, Mayor. So if you add Sunday back in there, could you remove a day from the front end? No. Mm -mm. Sounded good. <laughs> Sounded illegal. Okay, all in favor of approving item number one, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carry. May I have the reading of item number two, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council consider a resolution authorizing the city manager to award a contract to Callan Marine Limited of Galveston, Texas for the riverfront park restoration FEMA number 6499 project. This project consists of the installation of a new sheet pile wall, dredging, demolition, a new concrete dock, subsurface drainage, civil site work, new retaining wall, lot fall, restoration of two 48-inch drain lines, sidewalks, et cetera. Uh, we received five bids uh, for furnishing all labor materials, equipment for the project, and the engineer's estimate is $20 million for the project, and a uh, low bid was by Callan Marine at $16,879,376. Mayor Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number two. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? Council Member Gitz. Finally, <laughs> this is great. Uh, we're going to start the construction on Riverfront Park, and it's going to be wonderful. And it looks like it's actually going to be able to be coming in below our cost projections. So well done, and let's move. Yes, thank you, staff. <clears throat> Any other comments? Councilmember Turner. The timeline is showing one year and 185 days, so it's looking like we should be able to be done with that by what, the end of? It's 550 calendar days for completion of the project. Okay, so it's 550 calendar days. So a year days. and a half year and a half from when they kick off. Oh, so it's a year and a half from when they kick off. Right. Okay, that, that's the point I'm missing. So uh, estimation of when we have a projected end date, and the follow-up question is what it looks like. I know some people who may not know. Can you tell them how to see the vision? I don't have a projected end date yet because I don't know <coughs> when they're going to mobilize and start quite yet. Um, once this is awarded, we'll get with them, and we'll set the, the beginning date, and it'll be – a year and a half from that date. Um, basically, we're going to restore Riverfront Park to the existing shoreline post Harvey, uh, as well as restore the sidewalk along the, the bank, uh, restore the lighting, benches, water fountains. Uh, we'll do some work on the pavilions, but it'll basically just put the park back, uh, but at the new uh, borders after the, we had the erosion. All right. Just a few people asked about a timeline. That's why I was concerned. I wanted yep. to be able to answer that for them, but I guess we can get back with them once we get the information. Yeah, I mean, we, probably another month, two months. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Once I have that beginning date, I can give you all what it is, and then it'll be a year and a half from that date. All right. Thank you. Sure. Council Member, Mayor Pro Tem Durio, then Council Member Getz. Uh, Bart, just for the audience, uh, this <coughs> – when most of this delay was because we were waiting on the approval from the Corps of Engineers? We had to get approval from the Corps of Engineers, the General Land Office. Um, I'm missing one other. Um, but, yes, the regulatory process was, was long on that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Council Member Getz. And, Bart, I think it's important for the public to know that even though 
this particular resolution does not address anything other than repairing the damage to Riverfront Park that was occasioned by Harvey. The fact that the council engaged with this land swap with the port to acquire that property, the rail beds, <coughs> which is contiguous to Riverfront Park, is actually going to expand the footprint that we have down there. Is that correct? We'll be able to, to expand the green space. Uh, you won't see as much of the gravel from where the uh, the rails got removed. So in the end, after we finish the park restoration and, and we get to addressing that, there'll be a, a lot more green going from where the rail is now all the way down to the park. Thank you. Any other comments? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. May I have the reading of item number three, please? Council consider a resolution authorizing the city manager to water contract to Gulf Coast, a CRH company of Beaumont, for the Ford Street Roadway Rehabilitation Project. Uh, the project consists of milling the existing asphalt pavement, concrete pavement repairs, concrete curb and gutter repairs, cracking joint ceiling of existing pavement, resurfacing pavement with hot mix, asphalt, and concrete. Uh, Gulf Coast's bid, base bid amount is $6,079,536, and this is funding through the capital program. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number three. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion or comment? Uh, I would just like to say uh, I'm glad that this is finally getting to this point where we can get this done. The reading some of this, so what, whatever is asphalt is going to be replaced with asphalt. Whatever is concrete will be replaced with concrete. It'll be a asphalt overlay the whole way after okay. we're done. When it, what, what exactly does um, asphalt milling, what exactly is that? That's when you grind off the existing asphalt surface. So we'll, we'll mill off the, the several inch <coughs> top of the asphalt surface. Then we'll do base repairs the length of the roadway. That's where that concrete repair comes in. Your base has to be good before you do your asphalt overlay so that you don't you get a good road structure that'll last yeah. and that's that's going to be fourth is that going to be from calder to cardinal or is that from uh it's the entirety of fourth. the entirety of fourth. fourth street is one of the main fourth street actually runs through three different wards in beaumont yes so sir. that's pretty good we're glad to see this one thank you uh one question bart do you know where the, where they would be starting? Uh, I don't at this time. Uh, we can we can talk with them once they once we award it and see what their plans are. But uh, I, I'm sure they'll start at one end and go to the other. But I'm not entirely sure which which end. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Gates. The uh, millings from the uh, asphalt they ground grind off could that be used to help? replace some of the equestrian trails at Terrell Park we've used from other streets in the past but we kind of ran out of we, ran out we of could them. but we had millings that were available at streets and drainage I've already moved some over to Terrell Park for parks to use on that good okay thank you as per the last conversation we had on that thank you great repurpose question thank you any other comments all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carry. May I have the reading of item number four, please? Council consider a resolution authorizing <laughs> the city manager to apply and, if approved, enter into a, an advanced funding agreement with the Texas Department of Transportation for the Transportation Alternative Set Aside Program. Uh, this is, they had a call for projects in December 2020. 22 for this program uh, each city can submit a total of three projects for funding consideration the preliminary applications are due on January 27 2023 to text out the three projects recommended by staff are shown uh, below and these are makes basically for uh, school zone sign improvements and sidewalks in these key areas 
one of the things we're focusing on staff and more grants. So this is a part of that activity and seeking out grants that are beneficial to the city. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number four. May I have a motion, please? So move, move to approve. approve. Second. <laughs> I don't know. It was a race. I think everybody did, <laughs> except me. Councilmember Samuel? Move. Motion? It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, Shaw didn't say anything. I, no, I, 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 I think it was to, Mayor Pro Tem Duria. Okay, then it's that way. Mayor Pro Tem Duria, second. <laughs> so, is there any discussion? I would like to say that the reason why everybody has tried to make this motion go through because we have waited for a very, very long time yeah. to add sidewalks to uh, the neighborhood schools. Uh, one of the schools uh, getting sidewalks will be Belmont United. Uh, Charlton Pollitt Elementary will have sidewalk improvements also. And then it will be citywide school zone signage improvements because for some reason people see the flashing light and just ignore them. So there will be some upgrades in our school uh, zones and uh, sidewalks that we have long, long waited for. So um, thank you, staff. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Durio. So uh, are all three of these projects going to happen, or are we competing, or are they competing against each other, or are we competing with other cities for this money, or what? We're competing with other cities. It's a competitive grant submission <clears throat> for the uh, uh, Transportation Alternatives okay. Program. But you're going to make sure that we get it, right, for those sidewalks <laughs> in front of Beaumont well, United? <laughs> one of the uh, key indicators is low to moderate income in those areas. So we assessed the projects, and we looked at um, – the ones that we felt would score the best through text dots. We feel these three have the best uh, chance to get approved. Okay, and how long does that process take? I don't have an exact, I know when the submission is, the preliminaries due the 27th, mm -hmm. they'll glance over everything, make sure that it meets the preliminary requirements and then they'll ask us to submit the detail uh, submission for these and then it goes through assessment so I don't have a, an exact date on when they'll decide one way or another all right thanks councilmember Turner uh, yes uh, first and foremost I would like to thank staff because we discussed this several times we have citizens from the neighborhoods come to the podium and speak on it and I want to thank y'all for being creative going out the the free money that's out there like, I think we're taking advantage of it. So I want to say thank you, and also thank you for listening to the citizens that came and spoke about this. Appreciate it. Councilmember Neal, then Councilmember Felshaw. Thank you, Mayor. So on project two and three, the LMI for project two is 73.28, and the LMI for project three is 55.9. What's the overall LMI for the city? I don't. I don't have that number uh, in front of me, but I think I think it's somewhere <laughs> around 50, but I'm not positive. Well, I can get it to you later. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Felcher. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're applying uh, for two things, the project itself, and then number two, we can ask for the transportation development credits. That would be a second one, correct? Yes. Uh, on the TxDOT site, they outlined the Transportation Development Credits Program, and we inquired into that, and they said to refer to a map on their site, and if your city was covered under that map, then you were eligible for these credits. So we, we did check that. We are eligible for the credits. So we will be applying for that to cover our match as well um, if the project's submitted. And you have no way of answering this, I know. But just in, in looking at this and, and, and with just <clears throat> your past experience, how confident are you that if we get the projects approved, we would be eligible for the, the credits? I, I don't have know. No this is our first run through asking for those. So okay. if I was 
100% confident I would have written it a little differently, but um, because I'm not entirely sure how that process will go, I think we have to plan for the match uh, while we're applying for the credits. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Any other comments? Uh, I got one other question, Mayor. Councilmember Neal. Didn't we apply for this in 2019, too? We applied under safe routes to schools. Bicycles. Uh, our, our understanding, we made several runs to text dot asking for clarification, but it appears at this point that safe routes to schools has been folded under the transportation alternatives program. So before safe routes to schools uh, was available to all municipalities to submit projects, there were no limits on project submissions and there were no match requirements for anybody. So it was an extremely, extremely competitive program because the bar was low to submit anything you wanted under that. And at least in recent history, we have not gotten any awards under that Safe Routes to Schools. I believe the last one I'm aware of in the area was Jasper that, that got a million dollars worth of sidewalks through that. Now it's folded under transportation alternatives. You're limited to three projects and there's a match requirement. So the landscape's a little different than it was under <coughs> at that time. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All in favor for approving item number four, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carry. May I have that reading of item number five, please? May I just listen to the last motion. I just want to know who's on third. Some of you might know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry for the distraction. Council consider a resolution authorizing an agreement with Rail Pros Field Services Inc. of Irving, Texas for the monitoring and flagging services required by Union Pacific Railroad for the emergency repair of a sewer cavity under the Union Pacific Railroad at West Florida Avenue and Avenue A. Uh, as a requirement by Union Pacific Railroad to proceed with the emergency repair, we had uh, talked about earlier, an approved company must be on site for observation and flagging, flagging well, during construction. Union Pacific Railroad has approved Rail Pros Field Services Inc. for the required services for the amount of $150,000. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number five. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Neal. Thank you, Mayor. So what's the daily rate for this company? Uh, Mike Harris will come forward. Thank you, Mike. I have to look it up right quick. Uh, the daily rate is they're actually <laughs> sending two people, a flagger and, a, and an observer and the daily rate's about $2,500, $2,800 a day for both. Uh, the reason we went with 150000 we did it as a blanket PO uh, because the contract is a 45-day contract on working days. So that's what we just kind of based it off of, their daily average. So uh, the 150000 it may not be that much. Depends on how soon the uh, contractor finishes the work. So are we just boring underneath the railroad? No, uh, we're having to do a dry bore, 36 inch uh, dry bore under the track. Also replace the uh, sewer main that's under the track. We're going back with a 30 inch HDPE. And you only need this company there when you're physically underneath the track, correct? When we're on railroad property, which the whole entire job that we're changing out the sewer main is all railroad property. From right away to right away. Thank so you. It's kind of what we run into uh, two years ago when we did the first repair out there. We were able to repair up to the railroad right away and then had to basically stop it right there. I guess just one more comment just to clarify for the rest of council. <coughs> we're going to spend just as much money on hiring somebody to sit out there and watch the guys work as we're going to spend on getting the work done. Agreed. Do you have any way we can get around it? That's the railroad company for you. It's required by Union Pacific. 
Not that we can do about it. Okay, you got own employees. <laughs> we'll watch them. <laughs> well, that's my council member gets. That, that's my comment too. We're we're, we're paying almost three thousand dollars a day to have one guy flag track. Two, two one guy. guy flag traffic and one guy well, observe. Actually, with the flag, he won't be flagging traffic. He'll be flagging the train. Okay. Uh, basically, cool. he watches for the train in communication with the train. And cool. as the train approaches, he moves, stops construction, moves everyone and clear of the track as the train goes by. So the train will still be using this while this work is going on? Correct. Yep. We're at the wrong job, huh? I no doubt. <laughs> Any other comments? Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That was a reluctant aye. <laughs> I know. <Not everybody. laughs> the motion carries. May I have the reading of item number six, please? Council consider a resolution approving a contract with Marsh Waterproofing Inc a provider for maintenance and repair services for use by the facilities maintenance department. Bids were requested for an annual contract to, to provide an on-demand repair, maintenance, and light construction services as needed. The contract does not include demolition services or projects which are reasonably anticipated to approach exceed $75,000. Funding comes from various city funds and a recommendation of the resolution is recommended. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number six. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Have a motion and a second. Second. Have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? No discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. May I have the reading of item number seven, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> Council, consider a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Evergreen Solutions, LLC, to conduct, to conduct a compensation and classification study. <coughs> uh, Evergreen Solutions, along with two other companies, submitted proposals. Uh, after evaluation by staff, Evergreen was selected with a total cost of $52,500, and this is actually the salary, what we've called the salary survey study in the past, and uh, it's to be funded out of general fund and with the recommendation for approval of the resolution. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number seven. May I have a motion, please? So move for approval. May I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? Council Member Getz. Mr. Manager, I uh, I agree we need to do a salary survey uh, wholeheartedly, but I'm wondering, since every city employee and every city in Texas that their, their salary and compensation package is a matter of public record, why are we having to hire a firm to do this and spend $52,000 could we not just send out Public Information Act requests to the various cities of similar size and demographics to Beaumont, or are we getting more than just simply uh, salary information and benefit information for <coughs> employees? Uh, explain that to me, please. Okay, I'll, I'll call Chris Kettle into the to the podium. But basically, you are getting a much more comprehensive study information than just a information request uh, here. Evergreen's one of the leading companies in, in, in getting this information and they've accumulated quite a bit and it's just not um, cities. You know, sometimes it's comparable industry in your area to provide information which you can't get through a public information request. So Chris can add to this and talk about it. Yeah, to follow what the city manager says, um, <laughs> Evergreen is specific to compensation, but we're also doing classification. Uh, City of Beaumont has not performed this type of study in 20 years, so it's well overdue. Uh, recently, Jefferson County uh, used Evergreen for their compensation and classification study with good results a couple years ago. So we feel at this time, um, leave it to the experts to find out exactly uh, what a fair salary is for all our employees because we have you know, over 400 job descriptions. And what they'll do is work with um, 
city staff to determine uh, best practices in um, designation of positions as well as the classification used in budget. So um, this will be a big part of budget considerations for uh, employee compensation. And um, like I said, it's just long overdue. It has been done in 20 years. And Evergreen specializes in specifically compensation studies. We also had some bigger conglomerates uh, submit, Baker Tilling and Gallagher. Um, but they have other um, interests as far as insurance risk management. So we're getting Evergreen who specializes in compensation and classification. So if we come back and find out that we have people classified in a position where they're being paid a lot more, are we going to reduce those? Or, I mean, how, does this, how are we going to apply this? Just from my experience, I would say that that's unlikely to happen. Councilmember Turner. Uh, Mr. Manager, our staff, I asked in the process of us going through the city manager process, do we do comprehensive salary studies? You know, <coughs> because we're coming up with prices to pay employees, staff, and I was told that we do do these studies, and I asked to be provided with a copy of the study. I never received it. So I want to know if the, the kind of studies we do different from the one we haven't done in 20 years versus what I was told during the process of, you know, hiring the city manager, I asked if we did comprehensive salary studies, including when we discussed minimum wage with the budget season. I asked that question as well. I was told we did it, so can someone speak to it so I can get a better understanding of what salary study are we doing? Yeah, I mean, what, what HR would do would be to contact your local area cities <laughs> whether it be City of Port Arthur, City of Nederland, City of Port Natchez, Jefferson County, uh, or we could contact our um, similar cities with similar populations, whether it be Waco, Abilene, Round Rock, et cetera. But that's as far as, you know, city staff would go. Evergreen, like I said, they do this every day. They've got insight on industry because we want to look at private sector as well. We lose good employees to private sector. so. We're going to use this as a tool to retain talent at the city. Um, so they have a more extensive arm of what they can do as far as research is concerned. Um, so that, that would be the difference. You know, we would just go local um, and then similar cities. This firm looks at everything, including the private sector. Okay. So we were doing it at a local level, like cities surrounding our city versus going all out, getting a comprehensive study, comparing it to the overall population in other cities, correct? Right, and it's hard to compare given smaller cities may have a position that maintains many more responsibilities than, say, um, something, uh, a position at the city of Beaumont, which is isolated to a certain duty because we have a more employees and a larger um, environment to work under. All right, thank you. Councilmember Gibbs. <laughs> so I'm a little confused. How does Evergreen have the ability to ascertain this information from the private sector uh, more so than the city? I mean, you know, the private sector is not going to necessarily want to divulge what they're, you know, paying somebody unless it's a, a publicly held corporation, and you know, then some of their uh, positions. Uh, might be available, but how, how does that happen? Yeah, I think they're in tune to the industry. Like I said, they did a survey for Jefferson County a couple years ago, so they've already researched this landscape, so to speak. Um, and it'll be just used in their research and comparison. I mean, for the most part, you're going to look at, you know, what does an equipment operator make at a certain city or a certain <coughs> entity. Um, but some of the research will be, well, you know, what are they paying at the refineries or what are they paying at other entities and what is a fair salary for municipal government? Is it your position that we need to try to match, you know, dollar for dollar what private industry is paying? That's never been the case. Um, the city offers other benefits, including a pension that's considered as well. So historically, municipalities have not paid as much as the um, private sector. However, um, 
the only entities that have pensions would be teachers and municipalities, which is a big benefit um, that, you know, you know, other private sector entities may offer just 401k, et cetera. Um, so there, there's a, uh, a full circle of benefits you would have to consider, but historically municipalities have not paid as much as private sector. And that's okay because uh, employees that are hired understand the other benefits and it's a full total compensation perspective. If I may add, Mayor, uh, you know, they look at, that, they'll give you a range, a uh, salary range in this compensation study, <laughs> and then you as an organization will have to decide whether you want to pay on the low, mid, or high end of that particular range. You know, whatever they say is not, you just have to pay the highest. We'll, we'll discuss it and say we want to be in the middle. Or we want to be at the low end or high end. But in any case, we want to be in, within that range out there. And also, this there are other residual impacts with this study. You get job descriptions. You get to update your job descriptions because you have to have that information to determine what you can pay people. So uh, you get current good information on what you need with your organization. And it's and and. Personnel cost is one of your highest costs as an organization. And this, the dollars you're spending here will more than well pay for itself and being able to establish what those parameters are and being able to pay people uh, when you have payrolls of $20 million or whatever it is, uh, you're probably wasting more money than that by trying to guessing <laughs> what to pay people. We'll have some definitive information on what to pay people. And like you said, you'll make, they'll make recommendations and it's up to um, city staff and, and management to decide, you know, where the city of Beaumont falls. And a, a big part of it is retaining talent here at the city of Beaumont is really important. Thank you. Council Member Turner. Yeah, I kind of agree with you, Mr. Williams. I think it's important we make decisions with data versus, you know, just making decisions <coughs> the way we've been doing in the, in the past. Uh, another thing I want to ask you about, when you say job descriptions, would it show us where we stand as far as other cities when it comes to some of our higher end, like the requirements, some of the things they need to have in order to be successful? Like, will it show what other cities, maybe educational level, uh, would it show all of that, no salaries, the description of what they have? It could be. It could relate to, um, you know, different analysis of your job descriptions. I know the trend is now some jobs that required four-year college degrees they're making exceptions for these because of the difficulty in hiring those positions um, what i've learned over the years is experience is very valuable sometimes you'll take an experienced applicant over someone with just a degree and some job descriptions right now um, it is a required to have a degree so that's something to review and look at and make changes as as necessary Agreed. Any other discussion? No other discussion? All in favor of approving item number seven, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. And have the reading of item number eight, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council consider a resolution authorizing the city manager to apply and if approved, enter an advanced funding agreement with the Texas Department of Transportation for the Highway Safety Improvement Program. The project fund, uh, is for funding assistance through the Highway Safety Improvements Program, uh, basically. Its funding source, 90% will come from federal funding with the remaining 10% from the city and the city's capital program. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number eight. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Is there a motion and a second on the floor? Is there any discussion? Council Member Getz? Oh. No discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. May I have the reading of item number nine, please? Council consider amending resolution number 21-111, uh, 
that the Beaumont City Council meet with the Board of Trustees of the Beaumont Independent School District a minimum of two meetings per year instead of quarterly to discuss items of mutual benefit or concern. On April 27th, uh, resolution was approved by council to meet with the board trustees on a quarterly basis. That was in 2021. Uh, since then, the city council met with the board of trustees of the BISD, and uh, during that meeting, a request was made that the resolution be amended from quarterly meetings to a minimum of two meetings per year. Thank you. You've heard that reading of item number nine. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? All in favor of approving item number nine, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. May I have the reading of item Mayor, number 10? before you move to the next item, there was a question about this or a statement made about this during public comment. Um, the resolution is for a minimum of two meetings a year, but just for the public and the concern that was raised, council and BIC can meet more than the two. So it's not limiting the meeting. It's just saying that they are, the entities are required to meet at least two times but further meetings at the discretion of both entities is allowed. Just wanted to make that clarification for the public. Thank you, Attorney Reed. <clears throat> May I have the reading of item number 10, please? Council <laughs> consider a resolution authorizing a gas and purchase agreement with OCI Fuels USA, Inc. OCI would, in, would uh, enter agreement with the city of Beaumont to purchase all biogas extracted from the city landfill for the purpose of securing a long-term supply of fuel for processing, processing the landfill gas into renewable natural gas. The term of the agreement will be for 20 years with the option to extend for two additional periods of five years each. OCI will be responsible for all design, installation, operation, and maintenance costs of the collection system. And the funding source, um, uh, well, not funding source, but solid waste will, will receive the funds, uh, receive the revenue. And recommendation <laughs> is approval of the resolution. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number 10. May I have a motion, please? Move to approve. I have a motion, a second? Second. A motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? Mayor Pro Tem Durio. Um, the revenues that's going to be received by the solid waste fund, they'll only be able to use, be able to use with solid waste. They're the only ones that can use it, those funds. So the, <coughs> excuse me, so the revenue is going to be derived at the landfill, mm -hmm. and that's uh, part of the solid waste fund. So those revenues will go back to the landfill operations. Council member gets. Do we have any idea as to how much potential money we could get from this on an annual basis? Yes, sir. During their uh, preliminary analysis, they said that over uh, 20 years, the average annual revenue would be 900000 That's great. Especially when it's coming from waste. Any other comments? Okay, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. May I have the reading of item number 12, please? Council. Cons 11. Okay. Council consider a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter an agreement with Hill Co. Partners of Austin, Texas to provide legislative services. Uh, with the 88 session coming up, and we have some things underway legislatively, including the formulation of a legislative agenda. Uh, we're recommending uh, the hiring of this firm for that. Uh, we got a little bit ahead of ourselves on this on Friday evening, and, and uh, so the city attorney had some things um, that they caught in the agreement that Sheree would like to talk about or address, but uh, this will be funded out of the general fund and based upon the city attorney's recommendation, on the city attorney recommending it, we're recommending approval of the resolution. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number 11. May I have a motion, please? 
Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? Yes, please. <laughs> So before council goes into full discussion, I did want to point out some changes that were recommended by our office um, before the, uh, the agreement is approved because it is referenced in the resolution. Um, under It's exhibit A to that item, page five. Under terms, fees, and reimbursement, section C, we're requesting that that Senator, that that paragraph add a notice statement which to read notice shall be deemed received and accepted when received by and we ask that representatives from the city and from Hillco partners be included with name address and email address on page six under governing law we're asking that a venue statement be added to read venue for disputes arising from this agreement shall be proper in Boma, Jefferson County, Texas. And then lastly, on page seven, the signature line for the city of Boma needs to be updated for the city manager. So I would ask that any motion for approval of this item uh, be uh, amended to include my changes. Thank you. Councilmember Phil yeah, Shara. I move to approve with the um, changes presented by the city attorney. Second. Need to be a second. Yes, I believe he made that motion originally so he can amend his motion so it still needs to be seconded. Second. I have a motion and a second on the floor for the amendment changes to the item. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, I'm sorry. I think Councilman Turner wanted to have additional discussion. I apologize. I'm sorry. Yeah. Councilmember Turner. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Manager, can you kind of speak to the, the why? Uh, with, with the state having a surplus <laughs> amount of funding that they have, like, and we have Jefferson County days coming up, well, we kind of have our own City of Beaumont legislation, some things we would like to see in the City of Beaumont together prior to, you know, Jefferson County Days. Can you kind of speak to the why? Why would we make the decision and do this? Yes, Council Member. We've identified some <coughs> things we'd like to see, and in, in particular, we've identified some a project here downtown and with the hotels, et cetera, uh, that would require a change in legislation that would include the city of Beaumont in that legislation, in those laws, in those laws. And that's that's the key reason we need uh, people in Austin who are on the ground who are able to escort our bill. It will be a bill uh, through the legislative requirement. Also, we have other issues such as with the school district that the school district has identified and uh, that will need help in getting things passed through the state legislature. You know, if you, you pretty much have to have people active and active on the ground over in Austin uh, to get things through the legislature. We're fortunate enough to have people representing us that are influential in Austin, uh, but still, we've got to get some things done through the House and the Senate. Uh, but so it's, it's great to have these people, and this agreement would not only go for the 88 legislative session, but it would be for the year round, even out of session term, where they would uh, keep us abreast of what's going on and things that we need to be uh, aware of uh, in between the sessions. So it, uh, it's, if we have legislative priorities, we have a legislative agenda, they're gonna help us shape our legislative agenda. They're gonna help us write it and produce a document that when we go to Austin on, Golden Triangle Day, we'll be able to put it in someone's hand and say, this is the city of Beaumont's legislative agenda when we visit the state rail, when we visit the senators, et cetera. So we'll have documents and also their support. Okay. Last thing, just, just two suggestions. To my understanding, the city of Beaumont, I find for throwing things out the window, is it $500 to be correct? If they, someone throws something out the window, we, we don't, we can't dictate that dollar amount. Is it through the state or how does that work? Like if someone throws out trash 
and the police officer writes a ticket, is it a 500 ticket for that fine? Wasn't prepared for that one. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm asking because the, these, are, these are things I'm concerned about, you know, with cleaning our city up. You know, maybe some of these fines can deter some of the decisions that they made at the state level. That's why I was asking. I think so there, there are fines that are set with, like, court cost fines that are set at the state level, and then there are statutory limits on the amount of, that you can assess for a fine. Mm -hmm. But at municipal court, unless, like, for example, a handicap, that's a strict liability, is the, the fine is a fine, right? It's $500. But some of the other, like, transportation codes and littering charges, there's a range for the fine. So I can tell you where the starting range is and um, what the – with the court window fine, is what it's called, is set at municipal court, and if there are any court costs associated with that, on tomorrow. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Any other comments? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Mr. City Manager. Will you please read the caption for our first public hearing? Yes, Madam Mayor. Received comments on a determination of the public health director that public health nuisances exist on the properties owned by James Eller, Jr. at 2332 Evelyn, Karen Possett at 9310 Josie, Annie Mae Woolrich at 1145 Goliad, and James <laughs> Callis at 5345 Rosemary, 5375 Rosemary, and 5395 Rosemary. Thank you. I will now open the public hearing, and City Clerk, will you please call the names? Um, James Callis, 5375 Rosemary Drive, Beaumont, Texas. Greetings to all. I'm here today to report progress at 5375 Rosemary and 5345 Rosemary. Last week and yesterday, I had I had Inspector <coughs> Boykin and Inspector Hillard come to the vacant lot uh, at 5345 Rosemary. Uh, I had them look at what was there. There was uh, three vehicles. Uh, they all started and they were removed from the lot and one of them is now uh, licensed for the street. Uh, I needed to know what, what all was required and I can't believe that I'm having this issue, but I am. So, in long story short, they came back yesterday and they gave me a verbal grade of 80, which I call a B minus. Now, I was not in full compliance because everything must be off the ground 24 inches. And that's the general rule of what I was fixing to read to you. 24 inches is the rule. Uh, they, they were pleased with the progress. I had them come over to 5395 Rosemary, which is a house on the corner, been there since 1960. I had firewood stacked that I was splitting, basically said it's got to be 24 inches, can't be on the porch, which I understand that. So I'm going to bring everything 24 inches. Now that's the good news and that puts me in compliance, but I must tell you, my neighbors are not going to be happy. They're, they're just not. Uh, but I'll be in compliance. So uh, the other thing that happened, which I, I resent this, they got the health inspector involved calling me a public nuisance. I'm absolutely not a public nuisance. The, uh, there's, uh, there's no rats on my property. I have feral cats. <coughs> the city, uh, the city um, <coughs> animal control says there's really no rule on feral cats. 
there, there's no rats. The problem is there's no Carolina wrens anymore. They used to come and have their babies. The cats are keeping everything to a minimum. So there's no rats and uh, the mosquitoes, I live right next to the canal and the ditches. Mosquitoes are everywhere. So I, I feel like they call that down uh, uncalled for. They sh I just don't think they should have done that. The, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, I guess I'm trying to tell you I'm in compliance. I'm working with the, uh, the code enforcement. Those two people were very courteous to me. I, I think you would find that I was courteous to them. And uh, again, uh, I have made progress and I have a plan for 5375 and uh, so that's that's my comment. Thank oh, you. This is a letter from my neighbor across the street kind of saying give me a little more time but I, I'm asking for more time. Thank you. Uh, James Eller 3587 East Lucas. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I touched basis on this earlier about <coughs> different uh, properties being basically labeled different ways and not created equal in the city of Beaumont. So, like I said, there's Flanagan's uh, Junkyard Museum over on uh, MLK. And the answer from the city and health code that there is, I'm going to say it by their words, uh, I have uh, resent the email. This is after I think it was a uh, 13 day or no 11 days that I requested this information. They kept sending back the wrong information to me. Uh, I have resent the email and called each uh, department. Uh, it's from the city clerk's office. The environmental health has no responsive documents on 1535 South MLK Parkway. Code enforcement has no responsive documents on 1535 South Parkway. The Hinchy House like I stated earlier in my first comments, is that there's floor from the second story and the first story completely gone. They're supporting two by fours, supporting the whole floor in just one section. There's not gonna be any kind of documentation on homes like that. My home is not in that same condition. My home has three flat roofs in the back and what I told uh, Felshaw or Councilman Felshaw is that easiest thing for me to do is just knock off the three rooms on the back of the house to make it back to the same original blueprint that the house was before those three were added on. Uh, I can easily make that done by just removing that. I would then have one door on the end of the house to wall in and then one door on this side to wall in and then I would be in compliant as of closing in the home. I can then put siding on the outside and replace approximately a thousand dollars in seals around the outer skirts of the home uh, and do the boards on the back side and paint. That's it, I already have the windows. I purchased uh, old classic windows basically that are the same ones. I've, I've been working on this for a while. I've been building up, but same thing like Beaumont projects, the city projects know that they don't happen overnight. We don't expect the city to do projects overnight and it doesn't happen overnight. Same thing, it's not gonna happen overnight with someone's home. I've asked the city of Beaumont at the 2610 sewer and street drainage uh, just to pick up pipes that they had strewn over on Google Maps, you could see the, the street poles. Raggedy, not, not lined up, not organized, everything. It took over 190 days for the city of Beaumont workers and backhoes or, ex, you know, whatever uh, track, track equipment just to lift those pipes and organize them. How is it to put all this on one citizen and expect them to do it in 10 to 30 days because that's the initial letters that's sent out to homeowners. 10 to 30 days. 10 to 30 days are proper notice to give to go to court. So it's 10 to 30 days, 10 to 30 days when the city of Beaumont has longer to adjust anything that they have. It's always easy for the city of Beaumont to point fingers and expect the citizens to do what they need to do. But I work a 60 hour job, 60 hour job all week for uh, since April, since December. Thank you, Mr. Ethler. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Gates. I have a question. I'm not sure who to direct it to. Maybe Chris, maybe Sheree, but <coughs> listen to Mr. Eller talk about his house. My understanding was that this uh, nuisance is more geared to his property and the condition of his property and not the structure itself. Yes, I believe Mr. Coleman, our yeah, health director, is going to give a presentation in a moment and we'll go, we'll go over the, uh, the issues. But yes, it's, it's more related to the, uh, the materials than the house itself. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. That's all I have, Mayor. That's all. Thank you. So, Mr. Coleman, <coughs> please come forward. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I stand before you to talk about some properties uh, that's been that we're asking for you guys to to declare. Uh, I'm gonna read according to the City of Beaumont's Code of Ordinances, Chapter 10, Hate Health and Sanitation, Section 10.01.001. A nuisance is defined as whatever is dangerous to human life, or whatever renders the ground, the water, the air, or food a hazard, or in or injury to human health, is hereby declared to be a nuisance. Also, the City Code of Ordinances further states in Chapter 12, uh, offenses and nuisances in Sections 12.07.003, that a person who owns or uh, occupies property commits an offense if that person allows litter to accumulate on the property. And as we can see before you at 2332 Avalon, and I want you to pay close attention to when we first start visiting the property. And when I say we, it's a collaboration between code enforcement and public health. As you can see on Avalon, the property has been in violation since 2018. <laughs> Storms here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're ready? <laughs> yes. Oh, it's going off again. Okay, on 2332 <laughs> Evalon Street, as you can see, uh, they started the property been in violation since 2018. June the 9th of 2022, public health got involved. A final letter was sent out to the property owner to uh, to clear the property and when you look at what's on the screen it becomes a public health hazard because due to the accumulation of litter it becomes uh, a rodent harbor and so when we talk about rodents on a property we have to keep in mind that the saliva the droppings the urine from rodents uh, can cause hernivirus which is a deadly disease. And so it's, it's, so we get involved to, <coughs> it's for the protection of the property owner as well as their neighbors. And so, you know, we come and we try to work with the property owners to clear the property. We give them adequate time to clear the property. Again, we've been dealing with Evalon since 2018. And so as we go out and we meet with them, they'll make progress, something happens, They'll stop the progress. Then, of course, we're getting calls from neighbors. You guys are getting calls from neighbors. And so then we get back involved to, to, uh, to be sure to get the property clean. And that's um, on Evalon Street. If you go to the next slide. And this is 9310 Josie. Property has been in violation since March of 2022. Again, you can see the accumulation of the litter that's on the property. And that violates uh, the code of ordinance for the city of Beaumont. And again, on this particular property, you can go back, Tina, on this particular property, again, they'll start making progress, <coughs> then they'll stop. I have a go ahead. <laughs> okay, so this was declared a public health nuisance back in August of last year. A final letter was sent out in November. What are we here today to do that hasn't already been done? Well, when we say declare, the public health gets involved. When code enforcement refer the property to us because of the accumulated litter, then public health sends out a letter to the property owner, giving them time, letting them know that if you don't clean your property, then your property is in jeopardy <laughs> of being declared a public health nuisance. 
let me help. <laughs> what council is prepared to do today is yeah. authorize suit. So, so you're, you're giving, you're investing that authority with the uh, the health director to, if he can't see compliance, to either clean the property or take the property owner to court to clean the property. When we file a suit like that, uh, <coughs> Ms. Reed, do we charge the homeowner for the city's expense of cleaning that up? Do we file a lien? Yes, sir, we, we do. Okay, thank you. So we get a court order. Um, so what we do, we do two processes. First, we go out for bid for the property to get the most effective cost to clean the property. Um, when we go to court, we tell the judge this is the estimated cost of the property, and we ask the judge in her order not to exceed the cost of cleanup. So if we go over that cost, then the city obviously eats it. But so we ask that our, our bidders just kind of say, you know, what's the, the most you feel like it's going to go um, for this, and then we get a judgment and file the link. Mr. Coleman. Yes, ma'am. The picture at the bottom, um, the area is clean. So is this just a different view? Well, you got to look at what's on the porch that's under the the roof area. Well, no, I was just wondering if the, the grass area was cleared. Yeah. But then it was moved probably under the shed. I, I don't know. Oh, okay. Probably so. Um, no. It's just hard to tell. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And if you can go to the next one on Rosemary, the gentleman was up earlier and we found out yesterday that his property at 5395 and 5345 is in compliance. That's what he was speaking of. But he has three properties and it's to my right, the one you see with the gate, that's 5375. So that's the one right now is still out of compliance. And again, we've been dealing with uh, this property since December of 2020. And so you see Roden Harbridge, um, you know, you got buckets and all that that's hold stagnant water, which <coughs> is breeding for mosquitoes, which cause West Nile. And a person get infected with the West Nile virus could end up with encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, and meningitis. And so that's the whole idea by uh, ensuring that these properties are in compliance with the ordinance. Mayor. Councilmember Gates. So as far as the requested action before council today, uh, Mr. Coleman, mm -hmm. you're uh, saying that we can strike 5345 Rosemary and 5395. The two 95. pictures on the left, top left, bottom left, is in compliance. That's what Mr. Callis was speaking of. But there's the one that's on the right where the gate is, 5375. Okay, so we can strike 5345 and 5395. Yes, sir. Right, you said the top left on my left. Okay. My, <laughs> my left. Okay. These pictures was taken before they went out on yesterday. And 1145 Goliad, uh, we first went out on the property in March of 22. The owner, Ms. Weirich, we found out is deceased. It's a nephew that's living there now. And we uh, sent information to the nephew. Uh, he hasn't responded. Um, we found out that he has a history of being uh, in and out of the incarceration system. <coughs> And so we'll, uh, we'll be getting with legal to, to determine our next steps with this particular property. And the average cost, if the city had to clean a property, it can range anywhere from 1500 to 5000 depending on how much litter is on the property. Any other council member now? Thank you, Mayor. Have you talked to, uh, I know this uh, 1145 Gilead is not here, but the other two gentlemen are both here. What are they requesting as far as an extension on time? I haven't talked to them. Um, I'm willing to talk to them. Uh, but again, when we're talking about additional time, uh, you know, we've been dealing with them for, 
for several years. And so we're, we're willing to work with them if they submit a plan and we discussed previous council meetings that if they made significant progress, we will continue to work with them. And, you know, that's what we're doing now with uh, Mr. Callis, that he 80 percent on those two properties that's no longer that's being declared. Uh, but we have to work with them to see how much more time they need. So uh, nothing today prevents uh the individuals from still working with code enforcement and the health department to come to some resolution that doesn't involve um, legal action. Um, all council is doing today is authorizing that in the event that it's necessary. Councilmember Gibbs. I know there's a saying that one man's junk is another man's treasure. But to me, a lot of this stuff on this property looks like junk. We have a landfill, and that which is junk can be taken to the landfill on a low boy and dumped. Is that correct? I'm sure it can. Okay. Um. And so, you, you know, I, I just don't understand how people's property is allowed to how you how you live like this. But um, at any rate. Uh, this uh, what you're asking us to do is uh, give us uh, within 10 days they're asking that the property be clean and of course you just said you'd be willing to work with them yeah additionally okay yeah, I, yeah. council member Turner I noticed out of the ones we discussed today you talked about one who actually submitted a plan and made progress has anybody else besides the one that we seen made progress submit a plan and make any progress no what we run into a lot of times with with uh, property owners um, what we think is junk they don't think is junk And that's what we run into a lot. In the pictures that you're showing yes. us? Yes. Council Member Felsen. So again, Attorney Reed, what you're saying is we, if we act on this today and uh, authorize the staff to move on this, these homeowners still got time. They yes. can still take action to clean this up yes. and avoid the city from come get, inserting themselves and cleaning this up and or taking them to court. Right, so this is different from like our dangerous structures, which is the next uh, public hearing. This one doesn't um, necessarily uh, invoke immediate action on the part of the city. They still have a chance to, to you know, communicate to with staff, to work to get on a, a cleanup schedule, okay. um, to come into compliance. What, what it does do though, is that it, um, we no longer look for municipal Fines as a means of enforcement, we go straight for civil litigation. Okay. Okay. So, I, I, I want to point you that typically staff does the report first, and we allow for those property owners to speak after. And so, because we did allow property owners to speak before, it may be prudent because it is a public hearing to allow them a second chance to speak now that council has been given information with photos and attachments so thank you I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to come back up mr. Eller if you'd like to speak and anyone else also any any other questions yes sir at, at property on, on Josie <coughs> Street if I'm not mistaken Josie yeah when he say when he had the same problem on Terrell Park Road he cleaned it up and then moved some of it over to Josie Street. <laughs> Is that? Yes. According to, yes. Yeah. Oh, so. Yeah. I'm glad it's not on Terrell Park Road anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 and again, you guys feel a lot of calls from citizens with, with living next to this, and we feel a lot of calls as well. And again, for as public health is concerned, it creates a public health hazard because of the nature of the diseases that could come from uh, these properties being kept this way. 
and, and before Councilman Neal comments, I will say that traditionally legal action is the last resort. Yeah, right. um, some people are receptive to having help. We've had um, you know, volunteers go out and help clean property, organizations go out and help clean property at no cost um, to the city, just strictly volunteers. So this it doesn't necessarily have to, to be something that involves severe um, you know, repercussions for the property owner. This just gives the city more options. I think Councilmember Nia has it. Thank you, Mayor. So declaring these public health hazards, and I know this is going to be a sensitive subject by bringing this up, mm -hmm. but what about all the tent cities around town? How can we declare that this is a health hazard, but in these tent cities where there's literally feces and buckets, not we, declaring those the same? We get involved if they are illegally on a person's property, uh, but I think attorney reed mm -hmm. gave a presentation <laughs> on on but when they're allowed to be on private property and they're not violating any of the city ordinances now once we get notice of tent cities where there's buckets and and you know and wasting buckets and all that we do get involved but we work with the property owner to get the person moved off the property uh, as well I'm, I'm not saying that these don't need to be cleaned up so don't misunderstand me on you. that but there's a double standard What's the double standard? Uh, those are a public health hazard too, the way that they're being operated. Right, and once we are made aware of those tent cities, we do get involved. Just like these properties here, you know, and it's, I'm sure there's probably more throughout the city, right? A lot of times we get involved because neighbors are calling or neighbors or citizens have called council members, then you guys call us then we get involved. And so once we find out about a tent city, we get involved as well. And the, and you know, and it's the same process, you know. So we are aware and we are actively working to resolve those problems. But I would remind council, let's just stay focused on the posted items. Please. Mr. Cummins, yes, thank you so very much. Um, yeah. There's no other comments, and we will allow for um, uh, I think it's them Mr. to come back. Yeah, Mr. Callis and Mr. Ellis are present. But before Mr. Callis or Mr. Ellis come back up to speak, just want to let the uh, audience know that um, on our phones, we've just gotten a message that the tornado is headed down Highway 90 and College Street. So you just might want to stay put here and spend the afternoon with us. <laughs> well, for safety reasons. Tornado warning. Tornado warning, I'm sorry. To stay in place. And if you leave, be careful. <clears throat> but Mr. Uh, Eller, if you'd like to, or Mr. Callas, Whichever one of you would like to come back up and speak since uh, the comments have been made by the health director and we've seen the pictures. Do you have any other comments uh, that you'd like I, for us to consider? I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak again and uh, I, I am mindful of what's going on <coughs> on my property. I don't want to give an excuse. Excuses, uh, excuses are excuses. So. I, I want to show that I put the effort into lot three, which is the vacant lot. And uh, just for Councilman Getz, I had a bunch of appliances in a trailer. I took it to Wright Scrap Metal on Warster Boulevard. I took two loads. I got $180. So that's what you do with metal. But our city, we're very special to have heavy trash. Heavy trash comes out the same day as regular trash. You can put anything you want on the street. They'll pick it up for lumber, for... Uh, for trees, they prefer to be eight foot or smaller. But I tell you, during the last hurricane, I drove around, I, I do construction, poor pine wood and several other places, they never got cleared. I quit going out there, but the city of Beaumont was cleared pretty quick because of heavy trash. So uh, I did put some on the street, and I'm going to put some more on the street. And for 5375, where I actually live, 
I'm purchasing a 14 foot uh, dual axle cargo trailer and all the stuff that I consider good is going in that trailer and all the stuff that maybe I collected because I just like to collect goes to the street and then I'll have a clean property and it will remain clean. So the, the main thing I guess that I was concerned is the, I, I think I have a good relationship with code enforcement and I have a good relationship with building codes. I just now had a relationship with health and I know they have their purpose. They are used to instigate and bring it to a higher level to get people to act. I acted, I continue to act. I don't wanna be, I, I don't wanna be up here doing this. So I do appreciate it. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Callis. Mr. Eller. Thank picture of one of the pictures but code enforcement went out like they're supposed to 24 hours in advance of a, a you know meeting and whatnot and he didn't include all the other work pictures that I did so I did clean up a whole lot and he didn't include that he only included one so whenever you misrepresent what's going on with what I have going on that's a little bit false that that's that's skewing the narrative and I'm tired of that type of like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing the picture of the buckets that's at the gate on the way out it's not that I'm just packing the stuff in that's underneath the carport elevated two feet the wood is two feet off the ground I did that because that's code the buckets are on the way out so the 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 top picture right there top right and the the top left that's that's the same basically picture that's on the way out that's the gate coming out to the trash the uh, picture right here at the bottom <coughs> right corner is an updated picture that I sent to the code enforcement uh, person uh, yesterday, or she should have received it one way or another. That's an old picture or it's a new picture. One way or another, that's what <coughs> picked up. So <coughs> if you want to sit here and point out things to me that aren't correct. Mr. Eller, uh -huh. just make your comments, right. but well, you can't direct it to him. People are not <coughs> being judged correctly. And like I said, Flanagan's Junk <coughs> Museum on MLK stacked from the ground up. So where's the nuisance here? Where's that nuisance? People aren't being judged the same way. And I'm tired of being picked on because I'm taking care of what needs to be taken care of. If they would give me the updated pictures, you would see. So where, where's, the, where's the code enforcement for that? Because there was no, there was no that was what I read. There was no responsive, no responsive evidence to that right there. This address here on MOK, there was no code enforcement. There was no health enforcement. So why is that? Mr. Eller, can you email them to uh -huh. us? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We'll do. But that, that's why I don't understand. How is the city not doing their job on that? <coughs> but yet my address, because it's the Oaks Historical, and it's down the street from Chris Boone. That's why. Mr. That's Eller, why. please don't call any names. Just facts. So, but this, is, this has no responsive documents to this address. And he has another property just as bad. And I'm going to investigate that and do open records on that. And I'm going to see if there's any investigation on that. I'm going to see if there's any code violations with that. Okay, we need but you to, it. one moment. I need you to keep your comments to your property. It is pertaining and to my property. Well, because not I, I else like is. fairness with my city. Can I ask you a question there? Sure. So I saw in the news last night where you were requesting another year to clean this property. Realistically, how much time do you need to clean this thing up? I thought that this was for the demo, L literally. As of the nuisance thing, uh, three days, not, not three days to clean it up, three days I had already straightened up all the front porch and anything that was on the front porch because anything actually on a front porch has to be elevated two feet off the ground by code, right, for rat harborage. However, like I said, compared to other areas, it's not being considered the same because of the area that the house is in. But Mr. Mr. Eller, mm -hmm. okay, let, let's just be honest. Mm -hmm. You live in the Oaks mm -hmm. Historical mm -hmm. District. Mm -hmm. Well, I had, yeah. That's, that's us. Not no more. That's the old house. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But on Avalon, uh -huh. and I mean, the neighborhood and the district speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. It's historic Oaks mm -hmm. District. Yes, ma'am. And this isn't something that just happened. Right. It's been going on for about five years. Right. 
I, I'll even say it a little bit longer. Being honest, I'm not going to lie to nobody. Yeah. Because it, it's construction stuff, not not the... And regardless of what it right, is. But then right. when you look at buckets, you look it was at water. Paint, no, but mosquitoes. all those have sealed tops. So it's not collecting rainwater. I don't have buckets of rainwater. So let's let's get to mm -hmm. a resolution because it is what it is. We 100%. see the pictures. Let's move forward yes. to one hundred percent. And and I'm not <coughs> against even being ruled against me being a nuisance. Right. If this is it, then no problem. I'm so, not. I'm just giving my point of view. If right. I'm not trying to have this like this, <coughs> this is not what I'm doing. It's not what I'm wanting or nothing like that. At the time, I was taking care of my mom. She was ill for four and a half years, dying. So. I took care of her, but dad died seven months later. So it's been an ongoing battle, okay, with siblings and whatever else. So beyond that, it, it had difficulties of me trying to run my business, and, and I did bring home material that I could use. Beyond that, it's gone. That, so, I'm, not, I'm not holding on to none of it. So how can uh, we help you get the situation in compliance? A little bit more time because I'm actually, I'm on a layoff from my job right now. I was working at the Blade Project. <coughs> Uh, I have more time right now being laid off to work on it. No problem. Yeah. So how much time would it, you need? It will take a little bit of time because of the amount, but the heavy haul, like anything big. Uh, but heavy haul can be moved to the street. And yeah, heavy, I, that's what I mean. And, I, and we can make arrangements to even get it picked up. Right. If yes, you put it to the streets. Oh, my low power. Yeah. yeah. So but no, I ten actually, days. That? Yeah, you, you time. Yeah, time is time. Right, we right, need. Right. You got to give us a window. Uh, if you give me ten days to show progress, ten day, and I mean a lot of progress, I, not just a minimum amount. You know, I'm talking about heavy progress. If you give me ten days for heavy progress, I would appreciate it for a checkup and then go from there. But still, rule against me as a nuisance, no problem. I just, like I said, I thought that this ruling was for the demo red tag purposes. I was incorrect on that. That's why I spoke more about condition two. So I guess jumping ship on to Mr. Callis is 10 days for your other property uh, acceptable? Okay. Thank you. Okay, but, so. But, oh, ahead. sorry, excuse me. No, you go. I was just going to say, but please include my up to date photos of all my updates that I have been doing. So if I wasn't updated from those pictures from yesterday, please include them from the work that I have because it's like I'm not doing nothing, which I am. Right. I don't want false representation of what's going on. Absolutely. Okay. Councilmember Phelps. Mr. Elder, you, I may have misunderstood you. You're not saying that's an improvement, right? No. Okay. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. But but I do say the top the top picture, the top that's on the way out. That's the that look, that's for a pickup. That's to the street. Oh, okay. That's what okay. I'm saying is that's the stuff to the that's the look from inside the gate right there. That's why it was pulled there. It's I feel like bringing stuff not instead of one at a time bring it to the gate and then I can haul it out one, you know, wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow, whatever, right? right? Compared to taking it from wherever it was at the time and then hauling it all the way to the street one, one trip, right. one trip. Well, and James, look, mm -hmm. you're gainfully employed. Mm -hmm. You've been a servant in our community. Yes, we know of the things you've done to yes. try to help citizens. Yes. Uh, we, we appreciate you, but, and we can't speak to these other locations that you're mentioning. Right. They're not before us. Right. We can't speak to that, right. and it's irrelevant. I mean, what we have to do is focus on you. I, you. I just need to know as a council member, if I agree to give you more time uh, to work on a project that's been going on since 2018 or whatever it's been, I need you to tell me that you're going to get this done yes, and clean up this yeah, yes, because sir. this can't happen. Right, and yes, I know you don't want this no. in our community. Right. So. Please. Oh, you might. Oh. I'm sorry. But, but you I, heard me. I heard you, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not holding on to none of that. I wasn't holding on to it. I was scrapping at one time. I had a little bit because I was doing jobs at homes and whatnot. So okay. I was bringing home metal no longer, you know. So then that was one thing. Uh, paint buckets because I painted. You know, I did all kind of home remodel stuff. So that was a thing. But they were all sealed lids. I had three uh, paint buckets, uh, uh, gallons that had, and this is full disclosure, I had three that had uh, the metal lid had deteriorated from the rain, right? But beyond that, they're gone. But that was the only thing that ever held any water was three one gallons. Now, when I was contacted by, I think it was Justin Jackson, the health department, I think that that's, I'm just, environmental health, he had spoken about, well, uh, Mr. Elwood, do you have buckets of water back there? No, and he seemed confused as of like, what was I talking, or what was he talking about and what did I tell him? Because well, I'm gonna tell you this, Mr. Mm -hmm. Justin, 
is very, very thorough mm-hmm. in his job right. and what he does. Right. And so if he goes through your property, mm-hmm. you best better believe he's going to have a code mm-hmm. to go with it. Yes, ma'am. So we're not going to go any further with this. Mm-hmm. You've made an agreement 10 days so that they can go back out and check your property. Yes, ma'am. And as Council Member Phil Shaw has said, mm-hmm. I mean, you've worked in our community. You've worked with the homeless. I mean, you ran for office two years ago. We know who you are. Yes, ma'am. Situations happen. Yes, ma'am. But within five years, mm-hmm. that's a bit much. 100%. It's been stretched. 100%. So in 10 days, we're going to go back out, yes, ma'am. recheck your property, mm-hmm. and then we'll move forward okay. from this point on. Yes, ma'am. Council Member Turner wants uh, a comment with you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Eller <laughs> and the other gentleman who came up and spoke, the first gentleman, Mr. Callis, I want to let you know I appreciate your professionalism, you know, how you responded, you know, how you took ownership. I appreciate that. Mr. Ella, I thank you for saying a timeline because at the end of the day, I think we're trying our best to be fair. We let you choose the timeline today so we can move forward with this. And for city staff, when it comes to this type of job, it's not an easy job. Mr. Coleman, you're doing your job. You came up here and did the report as you were instructed to, and we worked together to get this resolved. How many people do we actually have that go out and do this? We have residents roughly 116,000 people. And I know we're talking about other jobs, but the reality is we have 116,000 people that live in Beaumont, including businesses. Like, how many people do we have that go out and do this job? Because that's a lot on staff that is actually doing this. Can anybody tell me how many people do this job with this many residents? There's five code enforcement officers that are the first level. <laughs> <laughs> Can a staff thank, member kind of educate yeah, me on you, that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Callis. Yeah, yeah so, thank you, Mr. Callis. But thank you. Yeah. Depending on the issue between code enforcement, we have building folks that are enforcing the property maintenance code. Of course, we're working with our partners at Public Health. There's about a dozen a dozen folks that are in the field looking at these things for uh, about eighty plus square miles and about forty thousand buildings. So that's what we're and, and Chris, my reason for asking that is I get a lot of calls as well as people report it in. Of course I send the email to the city manager, let it filter on down. But the reality is that's a lot of radius and ground to cover for a dozen people. So I want the community to keep that in consideration as well, not make an excuse at all because it all needs to be covered, but if we got a dozen people, it's roughly 12, working on the whole city of Beaumont. And those properties that you brought up, i like to know the addresses as well because I'll see if we can get that addressed. But the reality is I'd rather us work together and communicate and try to solve it and not go after each other, both sides. So if we can do that, I would appreciate that, Ms. Ella. We can kind of work on everything all together as well as yours, all right? Okay, Ms. Ella. Mayor and Council, one of the, and I don't, I don't know if this was provided to you or not, one of the count, uh, properties that Mr. Ella mentioned on MLK uh, was declared art. So right. long before my tenure, there was a, a dispute um, or some type of issue involving that property, and it was declared to be art. So it's not, yeah, but rats. It was declared to be art. So like I said, everybody is in charge the same. Council member Phil. No, it was declared to be art by a superior court. So right. it, so it's it, you know, he council two other properties council doesn't right. have the authority to overrule um, a court order or court authority. So I'm not really sure what the other properties are, but that particular property, that photo, I'm familiar with it. Uh, it was declared art. Mr. Eller, you said that I'm assuming ten days is not long enough. No. But if no. we if we said to you we would give you up to but not to exceed thirty days, could you you think you could get this work done in that amount of time? Most likely, yeah. Thirty uh, at the most, maybe forty-five, but thirty days, yeah. yeah. So, Mr. Eller, we've gone from ten days to thirty days, now forty-five days. But you, you set the timeline no, see, at ten mm-hmm. to come out for a reinspection. I just—that's what I said. Okay. Yeah. I so see. we'll start off with ten days, mm-hmm. reinspection, mm-hmm. and then after those ten days, then we'll discuss other times. Right. So okay. That's what I was adding on to is—is is if it was completed, completed. 30 to 45 days. Yeah, it may not be totally completed. Exactly. That's right. But like you said, within 10 days, yeah. you can make significant some progress. Yes, 
Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for significant progress, not just a minimal. Right. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So see if you take some of that stuff you have and make art out of it. Oh no. Then you won't be uh, before. Can I just go ahead and declare my property <laughs> art? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Eller. And I'm gonna ask our uh, health director if he'll come back up. <clears throat> well, we I passed around some recent pictures from Mr. Eller's property, but just to make council aware if you didn't already know, if there's no water service at the property you're not eligible for heavy trash pickup. I was just informed of that. If there's no water at the property, then you're, you're not eligible for heavy trash pickup. And that's because the water and trash services are built combined. So absolutely, there, there is a reason for that. So are any of these properties that are under consideration without water services? The one we were just speaking of. The one on Avalon? Josie. Okay. Does not have water. So. Okay, Mr. Eller, can you come back? So. Can we pass this and let the health department and the attorneys figure it out? Well, you just made an agreement for 10 days and you said that other trash is pushed to the street for pickup but they're not going to pick your trash up without well, they, water service right well i mean they the the neighbor puts their trash on my yard and the city picks it up regardless like they put their heavy boxes or couches and whatever else that they don't want mattresses they put it on the corner of both of our properties That's, and the city picks it up so, so your I, neighbors are allowing you I'm allowing the neighbors to put their trash on, basically on my easement because it doesn't make any sense if I'm not staying there for me to worry about where they put their trash at. So I'm neighborly like that. I don't call in on my neighbors. Well, that's very nice, but yeah. in your situation, you don't have water. So without water, you don't have heavy trash pickup. But I'm saying the city has been picking up regardless because it's on the side of the road. So if the city wants to stop picking up <laughs> trash on the side of the road, that's up to the city. That's not up to me. Okay. Because it's not Ms. my Eller. trash. Some of it's not my trash. That's what I'm saying. Whenever it's put to my property, it's, you know what I mean? Like, they put their trash also. I understand exactly so what you're saying. The, the you're saying since it's already a pile of trash there, then everybody just make one pile, and then you're saying that the city pick, pick it up? I'm saying my neighbors put their trash there, yes. So the city automatically picks it up. They don't stop picking it up. They see trash on the side of the road and they crane lift it. That's what they do. That's not, it's not even my, okay. if, if I'm not even there picking up and putting out my trash, they still put theirs there. It's okay. That's the same thing I discussed over at my other house on El Paso. I don't put out trash on that side, but people on that side put out trash at my ditch and it falls in my ditch. And I've asked y'all. We'll to, see you in 10 days, Mr. Eller. You know, Okay. So do you have you have a ten day to, agreement to put the stuff to the street or no? No, you have a ten day agreement to make a difference uh -huh. and some progress on your property. Okay. And then after ten days, when they inspect, mm -hmm. we'll move from there. Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. But but what was the clarification? What do I need to do then with the trash then? And do I need to That's tell my a, neighbor? Guess what? You have to decide how you clean it. You have to decide how to remove it, mm -hmm. you have 10 days. You, right. you said in 10 days you will have progress. I'm, yeah, in I'm 10 days it'll be reevaluated. I'm just trying to figure out why I was called back up. To, just well, because we discovered new. that you don't have water service because when, water when and you, sewer mm -hmm. and garbage mm -hmm. are on your water bill. Mm -hmm. And without water, you, you don't have heavy trash pickup. When but, the city red tags, they remove the water. So that was the city's call, not mine. I, okay, I didn't. I had a credit to my bill, and the city. But we're going back and forth now. No, I'm just trying to figure out what y'all want done. What we want done is your agreement uh -huh. within ten days okay. to make some progress okay. on your property. After ten days, mm -hmm. however you choose to remove the trash, okay. then the city health department and director mm -hmm. and staff. Okay. We'll go back out, reevaluate your property, okay. and then after 10 days, we will move forward from there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank no you, problem. Mr. Eller. Uh -huh. 
Okay, at this time, we will close the public hearing. Thank you. Ms. City Manager, may I have the reading of item number 12, please? Item 12, dangerous structures. <clears throat> Consi consider an ordinance an ordinance to declare 50 structures to be unsafe structures and order the owners to rise to said structures within 10 days. If the property owner fails to comply within 10 days, staff is requesting city council authorization to demolish these structures without further notification to the property owner or city council action. Additionally, if the property owner or structure requests and is authorized by city council to enroll in a work program. All delinquent taxes shall be paid in full, or a payment plan shall be established prior to enrollment in the work program. Enrollment in the work program shall occur within 10 days after the effective date of this ordinance. Mayor, before we move forward with this item, I would like to point out to council that you didn't take action on the last item, so you'll either need to table it or both the resolution up and down as it relates to the public health nuisances. That is this one, 12. Yeah. No. We have to take action. Previously. We didn't take action on 12. <coughs> I, th I think you read the dangerous structure one, though. Yeah, that was for uh, dangerous structure. Uh, did I? No, we haven't read 12. He read, he read the public hearing for 13. No, I asked I for the reading of item number 12. I read 12 already. No, you, we did the public hearing. <laughs> now we got to read the item. We did the public okay. hearing on item 12. Okay. Now we need to take action on item 12. All right. It's been a long day. Okay. <laughs> Let me find it, 12. This is my book's not. Is it the request? No, we requested the public hearing, right? So it's <coughs> So it'd be consider yeah, 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 yeah. I got you. It'd be consider a resolution Thank finding you. and ratifying the determination of public health director that public health nuisances exist on the properties owned by James Eller at thirty at twenty three thirty two Avalon, Karen Placid at ninety three ten Josie, Anne Marie Wilridge at eleven forty five Gilead, and James Callis at fifty three forty five Rosemary, fifty three seventy five Rosemary, and fifty three ninety five Rosemary. Move to approve. Thank you. There's. <laughs> One moment, I haven't called for it. Okay, may, may I have a motion for item number 12, please? Move to approve. <laughs> and may I have a second? There's a motion and a second on the floor. Discussion. Council uh, Member Getz. 5345 Rosemary and 5395 Rosemary have already been have found been to be in compliance. And so, uh, would you, Council Member Neal, amend your motion to delete those two properties? Yes, sir. Okay, so he's going to... Do I need to make the motion again? Yes. Amen. You well, need to amend your motion. One address that was already, or the two addresses already done? 5345 45. Rosemary. 45 and 95. 45, 5345 and 5395. Move to approve the resolution removing 5345 Rosemary and 5395 Rosemary. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. But um, shouldn't we add 2332 Evalon to that also? It's in there. It's, it's in, in there. there. It's in there. It's in there? Okay, you just said it it's is. on Rosemary. Mm -hmm. He was amending to exclude those. Well, weren't we excluding, weren't we giving him 10 days? Shouldn't we exclude that one also? We're giving everybody 10 days. Yeah, so again, to, to remind council, the action that you're approving declares him a public health nuisance. I believe Ms. Eller is aware that the property be declared a public health nuisance. What he asks is that there be no civil action taken against him um, within that 10 days to allow him a chance to clean up the property. So that applies to all the properties on here, even the folks that's not here? Yeah, ag again, a as reference, there's, this one doesn't require immediate action. So this still gives the indiv individual property owners or occupants a chance to work with staff to resolve the matter without there being a legal um, or civil penalty. Okay. okay. Those two properties that are being removed, Mr. Callis already cleaned up. That's no, no, what no, that is. Uh, Okay, I got you. Got yeah, you. those they're two are no, no longer on the list. Yeah, yeah, but everything else stays on this item 12. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
The motion carries. Thank you so very much. At this time, Mr. City Manager, will you please read the caption of the second public hearing? Okay. <clears throat> I'm on the right one. Dangerous structures. <clears throat> Consider an ordinance to, to declare 50 structures to be unsafe structures and order the owners to rise the said structure, structures within 10 days. If the property owner fails to comply within 10 days, staff is requesting City Council authorization to demolish these structures without further notification to the property owner or City Council action. Additionally, if the property owner of a structure requests and is authorized by City Council to enroll in a work program, all delinquent taxes shall be paid in full or a payment plan shall be established prior to enrollment in the work program. Enrollment in the work program shall occur within 10 days after the effective date of this ordinance. Thank you. The public hearing is now open. City Clerk, will you please call the names, please? Mayor, if I may, oh, before sorry, we Chris before we call the yeah. uh, the first names, it, may I go over the rules real quick? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I know the manager touched on some of these, but real quickly for the benefit of the audience, council is going to be considering um, a request from the administration for the uh, order of demolition of these 50 structures. Uh, however, they'll also be uh, having a public hearing where you'll be able to request additional time. Um, uh, and if granted by council, um, you may be able to enter into a work program, but there are some, uh, some basic rules that go along with that. Uh, first of all, you must be the owner of the property. All delinquent taxes must be paid, or you must have entered into a payment plan with the county tax office. Um, you must enroll within a work program within 10 days of today. Um, it should be noted that if the property is sold after a work program is begun, it does not start over with a new owner. And then finally, a work program consists of a 150-day uh, period. The first 90 days is to dry in the structure where the roof is uh, secured, doors, windows, exterior walls, etc. And then the final 60 days of the 150 days is the completion of the uh, construction uh, to receive a uh, certificate of occupancy from the city that all work was done correctly. And Mayor, we do have these rules in both English and Spanish uh, upstairs on the second floor. And so I just wanted to point that out. One other thing, Mayor, is um, when these come before you, we do ask that anyone requesting additional time appear before council. I would request that item number two, which is 1580 Avenue G, um, be given, I guess, special consideration because we have been made aware that uh, the property owner has been rushed to the hospital, and so we just, they're not able to attend today. So I just wanted to point that out. That's number two, 1580 Avenue G. Thank you so very much, Mr. Boone. And, and Mayor, to that extent, to any property, we typically give a special consideration to property owners that attend, but considering the weather, and I know there were some people who did make it out, but considering the weather, we might want to consider individuals who may not have been able to make it or decided not to risk it and consider reposting the items, um, reposting the items, hearing from the individuals that are here today, but reposting the items for individuals who could not make it today. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we're ready. Okay, so Mr. Johnson is not here, so we'll go to um, Michael Nettles, 999 Cottonwood Street, Beaumont, Texas. He's speaking on item number six, 995 Cottonwood. Mayor. Number six. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so six. very much. Mayor, council members, I'm here to let y'all know that the property at 995 does not belong to me. The, the, the person that it belongs to is deceased almost 10 years, and his wife inherited it. So it's just next door to me, and I'm, I'm coming to go ahead, tell y'all to go ahead, tear it down, demolish it, whatever y'all need to do to it, because it don't belong to me. It's harboring rats, and they invade my property. And I just need to be taken care of. I'm trying to get this taken care of for <coughs> over a year now. And it doesn't belong to me. I keep getting letters and the property don't belong belong to me. It belongs to Kenneth Rubin. And he's been deceased almost 10 years now. So y'all can do whatever y'all want to do with the property. 
it'd be fine with me. Well, okay. unfortunately, if you're not the owner, you don't have a say so. I right. do apologize. Okay. Uh, but if, is it being sent in your name? Yes, the, uh, the letters are just coming to my address. I'm next door. Okay, can we just like not have public comment from the audience when you have come up to this podium? You can speak just so we can maintain an orderly meeting. Yes. Could you could you come to the podium, please? Look your head, sir. He actually is the legal owner, according to JCAD, and I have found a will that has him as the owner. Him being Kenneth Rubin, Sr. You're here for 1580, correct? 1580. Which one are you here? Sorry, I apologize. I may get you just mixed up. This one? I apologize. Wrong address. You're good. This is for 995 Cottonwood. Right. Okay, so Mr. Rubin, 1201 Calvert, you are not the owner. Okay, thank you very much. Can we make a can we make a motion to just offer an extension to everybody on this list if they meet the requirements that Chris Boone just laid out? Is that a problem? There, there's some people that have there's waited through the whole here. meeting. I know, that's what I'm saying. Give them an extension. But they're here today want to right. get so their the, business taken care of today. Because it's a public hearing, people who are present and want to speak uh, have to be given the option to speak. So is it better that we table it? Table so this item? That's they can't go home anyway. Well, <laughs> the question has come up because of the weather. So if you're here and you want your item read and you want to discuss it, you're welcome to stay. If you leave, we will give you an extension. It Just let the clerk know. I th I th yeah, I think you have to meet the, the requirements. Yes, and you'll have to meet the requirements. One moment, we're going to let the city attorney. Yeah, so, got to love the engineers. So brilliant. So, um, it, the statement has been made to allow people who are present to speak now and then council table it and bring the whole thing back next week to allow the people who aren't here uh, a chance to speak on it. And that way, those people who are here who've sat through the meeting who want to speak on their item don't have to come back. True. And we'll have a, we'll we'll have that noted in a minute, so we'll know previously who was there. We can just table the item at that point. Yes, sir. If you'll come to the podium, I can't hear you from. How many is one, I'm here for twenty forty five? How many are here for their? Oh no 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 no. no, no we no, don't no, do no, that. No. So um, no no. So what we'll do is that if you've given a green slip to the clerk, she'll read your name. If you're present and want to speak. She'll allow you a chance to speak. If you decide to leave, she'll make a note that you were here to speak on that item, and you'll be given a chance to speak when the item comes back next week. So if you're here and you want to speak today, you can definitely do that. If you want to wait till it comes back next week, you have the option to do that as well. We're ready to go to the next one. We're ready. Mr. Eller, did you want to speak again? Is he still here? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Just checking. Adam Sander, I think it's Sanders, 2102 Coach Drive, Colleen, Texas. Item number 12, 1735 Fairway. Good afternoon, all members. <coughs> 
Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Adan Sanchez, and I want to say very quickly for my petition. I'm here to request um, for repair this property in uh, 1745 uh, Fairway. <coughs> um, the only thing we want is repair the house. But I got ready to apply for the, for the permit, but um, I think it's Ms. Nancy. He, she said, um, we need to come and talk to, we ask for request the extension. So you're asking for an extension? Yes. yes. Okay. <coughs> And you are the owner. I know the owner. I got. I got. I, I got the property on the contract. That's I'll be here. Represented the owner. So um, I got the uh, the property. I got on on the contract. Okay. I do apologize, sir. You have to be the owner. You cannot speak on a property if you are not the owner. When you say a contract. We don't, uh, we don't know what you mean by contract. You must be the owner. Well, we got legal, you know, legal contract to buy the property. <laughs> that is why I'm here. You have a legal contract, but are you the, are you the official Hold owner? Hold on, Mayor. Have you entered into a contract for sale of the property? Yeah, well, we got between the owner. Are you purchasing the property? Yes. And, and so you have a written agreement that the pro that you're purchasing the property but haven't had the property legally transferred to your into your name. Yes, we got that, that contract. Okay, so t so technically, <coughs> if he has a legal document of a, co a of a contract for sale, he can yes. essentially act on behalf of the owner. But as a condition, you should probably consider that before entering into a work program that that can that contract for sale be finalized. Yeah, that's illegal. Definitely, it's legal. Mr. Couch, right? Yes. Okay. I, I, I'm okay. Put into work so Thank you. I have a letter to read from the homeless lady. So it'll be next week. Okay. Hilda Chavez, 992 LG Street, Beaumont, Texas. She's speaking on item number 22, 7645 Greenfield. Hello. Hello. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, Mayor. Um, I'm coming to uh, get an extension if it's possible for my property. I want to get back to live there. I got a note on the front, but I can live there because it was vandalized from uh, exterior uh, light, but I have already contact the owner of the land, and uh, I got the people to work on the house, on the electricity. So you're asking for an extension? If it's possible, thank you. Okay, and you are Hilda Chavez? Yes, Hilda Chavez, ma'am. Okay, number 22. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Robert Forward, 10811 White Oak <coughs> Trace Drive, Cypress, Texas, speaking on item number 23, 1210 Houston. Yes, greetings everyone to the board members and as far as you, uh, also you, Miss Madam Mouton. I'm uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak you. up some, please? Can you hear me now? Yes. Testing, okay. My name is Robert Forward. Uh, I'm here on my father's behalf. He's deceased. I've been in dialogue with Miss Wood, who's very knowledgeable, and I haven't lived in Beaumont for over 50 years. Uh, I was with the U.S. Secret Service. I was assigned to the White House when I left Beaumont and went to school. And uh, I just never returned, but when my father got ill, I did. The property that's in question, I do have a legal contract at this time. Uh, I can, 
got all the paperwork regarding the contract and everything and hopefully that property will be sold. They haven't given me a time or a date, but the company's name I'm willing to give to Miss Wood and uh, everyone has signed up on it. They're just going through the legal process with their people with the title company. The lady name is Maria Navarro. She's handling the paperwork for the company. So I'm just asking for some time for that to uh, take place and that won't be a nuisance any longer to anyone. Okay, so what are you asking? You're um, asking? I don't know when the date we're gonna, this contract is signed, but I just wanna make sure that I have some time, whatever you can give me. Uh, so an extension, that's just an until extension the paperwork is, is complete. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, can uh, anyone get me to Houston safe? <laughs> Safe travels, traveling grace to you, sir. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Valerie Raleigh, um, 4450, and I think that's Wood Crest Drive, Beaumont, Texas. She's speaking on item number 24, 4520 Ironton. Ironton. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just really asking for extension like everybody else. I bought the house last year. I ended up having to live in a hotel for about six months, so all the money that I saved is gone. I am resaving my home. I had an inspection done on it. They said that it was stable. I just have flooring work to do, electrical in two rooms, and I could have the house redone, I mean, re-inspected. I just need some more time to pay the people that I, I have coming to work on the house. I do have two people. It's about $2,500 to do the work. I just need time to get it together. And I appreciate it if y'all could give me that. This is my first home I bought, so it will be my primary home. I just ask for the help and the time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a 24 extension. Melvin Block, 3333 Turtle Creek Drive, Port Arthur, Texas. Item number 25, 3320 Lampasas. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm just here, same as the others, asking for more time. Uh, an extension on the uh, property at 3220 Land Passes. And um, like I say, the, some work has been done on it. We've got some left to do, but I, I've been living in an apartment for a little bit. I had a house fire myself, so it's kind of slowed me down on what I've been doing. So I'm requesting an extension on the property there. Okay, Mr. Block. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number 25. Mitch DeVillier, 2626 um, Calder, Beaumont, Texas, speaking on item number 27, 3810 East Linwood. <coughs> Hello, Mayor, Council. We just also would like to um, ask for an extension. We were going to bulldoze the house, but after talking to the contractor, lien holder, we decided I'd like to work with uh, Miss Wood and uh, see if we could save the property. Empty lot doesn't do any good. And uh, I did sign a contract with the uh, Ordway Construction to see if we can get an extension. If for some reason, within next, I don't know, within the next 30 days, I told Delancey if our budget is way higher, then we'll bulldoze it. But for now, I'd like to at least get a, you know, an extension to see if we could save that, save the property. And uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, sir, what is your name? Mitch Civilian. Are you Michael? Mitch DeVillier. Says Michael. Michael's my brother. It's, it's DeVillier Properties. DeVillier Properties. Properties, yes. It, it was listed under both our names back in the day. The so DBA. Are you the the owner? D yes, I'm the owner. <coughs> I'm Mitch DeVillier, Michael DeVillier's brother. It was listed under a DBA doing business as under DeVillier Properties. Just how it's listed. It all. Yeah, because when, when they call it up, even Judge Lively, and we, we had it that way. Okay, okay Mitch. Uh, David Ali, 15407 Liberty Prairie Court, Houston, Texas, speaking on item number 31, 430 Manning. Mayor, uh, Council, how you guys doing? Um, I'll keep this very short. Um, I am the owner of 430 Manning. 
Um, I this was uh, my first experience, I guess, uh, working with Miss Delancey. Um, I bought a property on Congress. I didn't. What I did was I did the assurance bond on the first one. I I'm about maybe 30 days from completing that one. I purchased a second one about maybe almost a year ago, and uh, I just requesting an extension because I'm trying to get construction funding to do the uh, to get this property off you know off the ground. Um, What's your name, sir? David Ali. So, David, are you the owner? Yes, ma'am. Should be labeled as like the Ponce Group. I own Ponce the company. Group. Yeah, I own the company. And uh, so, I finally got my lender. Basically, everybody's involved. I got the uh, all the bonds in place, uh, the assurance bond, and uh, we're 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 ready to get started. So, I'm just requesting uh, additional time <coughs> so we can get get this project up and running. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Jay, and I hope I don't botch this one up, Crescenciano Diaz, 1060 Pipkin Street, Belmont, Texas, item number 36, 1060 Pipkin. <coughs> Hello, I'm the one for 1060 Pipkin, and, uh, and I would like to know if he can speak for me, my son. Uh, hello, we have a question. We would like to know what exactly is wrong with the garage because it says it has some uh, un things that are not done with it. The whole the whole house is brand new. It's just a gr there's a contract under the house, but there's a garage and they're saying the garage is under it's not in code. So the pictures that we have, is this the garage? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Could someone come in? Thank you. 31. 31. 36. Oh, sorry, 36. We're on 36. So I did, so I did speak with them um, earlier uh, this week. I'm sorry, last week they did come in. So they did repair the house, but there's actually a garage apartment um, in the back. So I am fine with the house. Um, once it gets its final inspection and I let him know that but the garage apartment in the back has to come down So this is what we're talking about as a garage apartment not the house that y'all did So either you have to repair this like you did the house like we talked about or it has to be demolished Okay uh, so we would ask to give more time about a, a month probably because it's a lot of work to read well it. if they uh, if they agree to an extension so if <coughs> just ask them for an extension it'll be 150 days just like it was for the house okay so we, we would like to get an extension <coughs> for it okay there's back taxes owed no, uh, we'll ask about that and we'll take care of them soon. You're going to take care of the back taxes? Yes, we'll take care of the taxes. Okay, so you're going to pay it in full or get on a payment plan? We're going to do around half of the taxes at least. Okay, so you'll, you'll make payment arrangements for the taxes? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we, uh, we were asked to get an extension for it? So you're requesting an extension? Yes, please. Okay. And you're going to make arrangements for the taxes? Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayock, that here, 6315 Madeira Lane, Beaumont, Texas, item number 387795, San Diego. <coughs> Good yes, afternoon, sir. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we are under the process of selling. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. What's your name, please? My name is Mayank M. Vader. I'm a part owner of GMR Real Estate, uh, the item number 38. That's under that uh, business. Uh, we are under the process of selling that property. Uh, and we are just waiting on some title work. Uh, so I would request an extension. 
property taxes are paid for the property was purchased at the tax sale at the county there is no delinquent taxes or nothing like that so you're just asking for an extension until you sell it yeah okay I mean we are under the process of selling it and if for some reason the contract won't go through we will fix it <coughs> then I'll sign up for the program is it under contract right now yes we waiting on the title work okay councilman uh, but you're gonna sell as is correct yes, yes so the way the house is now you're hoping to sell it no we already have a contract so the Are contract you? says as is I mean we have done this before we have managed a lot of properties so if the contract won't go through we will take care of it so if you don't close then yeah. you're just gonna take then then I'll sign up for the program <coughs> but and then fix it either way property will be taken care of okay thank you mm -hmm. um, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, Marco Lacan, 640 Melrose Street, Bader, Texas, item number 46, 340 East Threadneedle. <coughs> Hi, my name is Marco. I'm, I'm here for ask a stand shop for fixing my house. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, sir. Oh. Your name? I never said. <laughs> Uh, I hear for a uh, one extension for fixing my house. Okay, you'd like to have an extension. May I have your name, please? My name is Marco Licon. Marco Licon. Marco, Marco. Licon. Okay, Marco. You are the owner? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you're asking for an extension, but I show that you have uh, taxes owed. I, I work in this thing for put everything straight. Okay, so yes. you're working to make yes. payment arrangements yes. for your taxes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think this is Jenny Guilford, um, 5725 Downs Road, Beaumont, Texas, item number nine, 5725 Downs. Item number nine. <clears throat> Take your time, ma'am. Hello. Hi. My name is Janie Guilford. Um, I'm here asking for an extension. Um, I was in a progress of trying to uh, repair my house. And what happened, I had bees in the house. And it was by my electrical box, so I couldn't get to the box. And I was waiting for uh, a beekeeper from Houston. I've been waiting for him for like two years. Because, yeah, you look good. Because, <laughs> because he was backed up because of the weather. You know, we had a lot of rain and all like that. So finally, I talked to Ms. Delancey, uh, and I told her, I uh, talked to a guy in Beaumont that would come and get rid of the bees, but the price was a little up there, and she told me about somebody. So I finally got rid of the bees, paid somebody to get rid of the bees last year. And I was supposed, to, and I think he came in May, because at the time he came, you couldn't do it in the wintertime because the bees wouldn't be any good. You know, they're endangered species, so I couldn't just do it on my own no we're a b city so, so now <laughs> i ran out of money and i still was trying to work a year ago i had three jobs i mean i have a stick and everything but they were easy i was i'm a caregiver so they were easy to pay good and it was enough money where i could pay for somebody to repair the house so right now i'm in a dilemma i talked to my place of worship and we're talking about some kind of help to get things going but in the event that if it's too expensive and they're not going to help me, I just come to the conclusion of selling it as it is. Because people have been asking me about a house for years and years and years, which I would like to move back in the house myself while I'm still living. I want to move in my own house. So I'm asking for more time 
to repair my house. Okay. <clears throat> you do know if you get into it and you start to fix it and you don't complete it within the time, you're going to lose everything that you put into it. So uh, this is what I'm asking. If it look like I can't get the house repaired and just go ahead on and sell a house as is. Okay. Okay. And I showed that you have uh, just a little over a thousand dollars worth right. of back taxes. You'll make uh, arrangements with the tax office for that. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Miss Gilford. You. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to go over the list of what we have. We have a 9 with a request for an extension. Number 12, extension, pending uh, a final contract on the property. Number 22, request an extension. Number 23, has a legal contract, waiting on the title company, Ms. Navarro, to complete the contract. Number 24 is requesting an extension. Number 25 is requesting an extension. Number 27 is also requesting an extension. Number 31, Mr. Ali is requesting an extension. Number 36 is requesting an extension with back taxes and will make payment arrangements with the tax office. Number 38 is requesting an extension. Number 46 is requesting an extension with back taxes and payment arrangements. Everyone has the same thing? Okay. So I'm asking, is there a motion for item number 13? Uh, we need to make a motion. Mayor, can we close the public uh, yeah, hearing? First, I'm sorry. Yeah, like first let's close the public yes. hearing. I'm then so let's sorry. read the item. Yeah. And then we can. Okay. We I'm going to close about the public hearing Thank and you. ask the city manager if he would read <coughs> the item. Thank you. <coughs> city Council, after conducting the public hearing, consider an ordinance to declare the following 50 structures to be unsafe st structures. And order, order the owners to rise to set structures within 10 days. If the property owner fails to comply within, within 10 days, staff is requesting city council authorization to demolish these structures without further notification to property owner or city council action. Additionally, if the property owner of a structure request and is authorized by city council to enroll in a work program, all delinquent taxes shall be paid in full or a payment plan shall be established prior to enrollment in the work program. <laughs> enrollment in the work program shall occur within 10 days after the effective date of this ordinance. Thank you. You've heard the reading of item number 13, and I would request a motion for item number 13 with the exceptions of number 9, 12, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27, 31, 36, 38, and 46. Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion to table this until next week. Excluding the ones she listed? Yeah. Excluding the ones that we've heard and are listed, correct? Here's my thought process. With the weather that we just went through, and if somebody couldn't make it up here for this hearing because of the weather, and we're about to tear their house down, I just don't think that's fair to the citizen. No, we've already made an exception for that. So what about the others? They can come back next week. So, so, so you, your motion to table would exclude the ones listed, 9, 12, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27, 31, 36, 38, and 46, and all remaining ones can be tabled. That's my motion. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. May I have a second? Second. I'm, I have a motion and a second on the floor. Don't ask me to say what she said. 
discussion, comment. <coughs> Council Member Samuel. I'm thinking there's going to be another motion. No, no, so it's table, so there is no discussion. Discussion. If it's a motion and second, it, y'all just vote on it. So, th so there's no discussion for for a table motion. Then you make a second motion based on the ones that you excluded from the motion. Right. So there's going to have to be two motions. Yes. Okay. We didn't start over. No. No. <laughs> I, I have a question. No discussion. No discussion. No. So here's the thing. You can, he can ask a motion for clarification. So mm -hmm. it's a motion and a second to table um, all items that were excluded. So 9, 12, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27, 31, 36, 38, 46 are excluded from the motion to table. That would allow the individuals who have already spoken not to have to come back, but the individuals who were not present for the pr public hearing to have opportunity to come back before council due to weather. So that's the motion. I think it received a second. Right. So a, mo a, a motion t to table. I, I got all that. I just got a question still. Okay. <laughs> so it's going to, uh, part of the resolution is going to be part of the agenda for next week? Yeah. Yes. The table. Okay, if that's so, can, like at the beginning of the meeting, can she uh, make sure if, if none of those folks are here, then we don't have to go through all these properties again? Yeah. Okay. Because the, pu because the presentation, the public hearing only uh, <coughs> allow, opens for individuals to speak on it. So she can open the public hearing. If there's no one that's there to speak on it, you close the public hearing immediately. Okay. And the ones we heard from today won't be able to talk next week. They won't have to be here. They won't have to be. They won't have to be here. They'll be, they will be removed from the agenda okay. item. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, all in favor of approving item number to table the item, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Now. Now. May I have a motion? I so move that those items which were removed uh, from the agenda today uh, be given extensions. And that is items that. 9, 12, 22. 9, 12, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27, 31, 36, 38, and 46. Mm -hmm. Those items, uh, I, I move that they be given extensions. May I have a second? Second. second. I have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you so very much. Thank uh, you for your patience. Can you yes. explain to those that we just read they don't have to come back? Those numbers that were just called, you do not have to come back. If you came before the council and requested an extension, we have granted your extension. You need to go to the second floor to make your arrangements for your extensions. Thank you. Be careful leaving. Um, yeah, the storm is passing. Thank you. And the storm is the, to the, the storm. storm has passed, but I've been getting texts on my phone. Just about all of our underpasses that are served by pumps got overwhelmed due to that downpour. So any low-lying areas right now are flooded until they get the ability to drain off. So be careful going through any underpass. The the one on Pine by I ten. Uh, the one at uh, Orleans and Park, right by College, 4th Street, uh, a large number of them are all, all containing water right now. So please MLP. avoid all underpasses at this time, traveling. Yeah, and we should be barricading them, but you know, just be careful. Don't, don't drive into any water, standing water on the road. Thank you. Be careful going home. Thank you. Okay, Mr. City Manager. Yes, Mayor. Work session. <clears throat> Review and discuss programs of the Texas Film Commission. As uh, Miles comes forward to do his presentation, uh, Texas Film Commission is a component of the Texas Economic Development Office. We uh, have been looking at things to bring economic development attention to the city of Beaumont. 
uh, as we went to TML and other uh, places, we saw presentations on on uh, Texas Film Commission and, and Beaumont becoming a film friendly city. And so Miles is going to ha uh, have a discussion on that with you, presentation on that with you today. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Good evening. Obviously, unfortunate circumstances for our citizens, but uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for can you hear me? Uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys. Today we'll be talking about, um, is my mic? Testing, testing, testing. Okay. It's very low. Okay. Just lean into it. Lean in. <coughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Better. Okay. Well, I'll just continue and then you guys let me know how I need to adjust. Um, so today we'll be talking about the uh, Texas Film Commission Film Friendly Community Program. Um, you can go to the next slide. No, you fine. So our objectives today is just to communicate to you what the program is, um, what's the process to become certified, and essentially how is it beneficial to Beaumont, and why should we maybe move forward with this program. Before I start, I do want to thank uh, city staff that has helped out with this program. This is a team effort. I'm just the one that's presenting it today. So I want to thank Sheree and the city attorney's office. They've been a great help. Uh, assistant city manager, Chris Boone, Dean Conwell with the Visitors Bureau, our fire chief, our police department, um, and event services. Thank Stacy uh, with that department and uh, Emily Willer. So obviously this is a team effort and uh, I just want to re-communicate that. Thank you, staff. Uh, so we'll move to the next slide. This program is administered through the governor's office uh, for economic development and tourism. Uh, it, it is considered the Texas Film Commission. And so the Texas Film Commission, as you see, uh, as we continue on, has many programs in film-friendly community. Uh, the certification process is the one that we'll be highlighting today. Uh, it's an economic development program to highlight Texas cities as potential film and television destinations, currently they have about 160 communities that are already certified, uh, that have already done films in their community. So uh, it's been going on for over 50 years, if I'm not correct. Um, I think the governor's office belief is that the data and trends are showing uh, that production of film is not just done in Hollywood, it's not just done in big cities, it's done in small communities, it's done in communities all across the nation. Uh, but more specifically, we're focusing on Texas and uh, how it could be beneficial to Beaumont, possibly. Next slide. Some of the resources with the uh, Film Commission program that, you know, I think are a benefit to us is we'll be placed in their uh, production directory. And so when people are doing films, looking for the state, when they, when they reach out to the governor's office and they're looking at the state of Texas, we'll be a part of that directory. And also you have a job hotline. So it opens up the idea if you have high school students or in, any individual in the local community uh, that has interest uh, in films that are done in the state of Texas, we'll be able to send out messages uh, through email to notify them or of extras that are needed or different actors. And so it's a way to inform the local community of different jobs. The Texas Film Commission also does sponsorships. Uh, if you have festivals of that nature, uh, sometimes they can financially contribute, uh, and other times they can, from a branding and marketing perspective, they can help put the word out about Beaumont and things that we're doing, uh, which obviously gets out to other communities, and I think that's a benefit for Beaumont. Uh, we can move to the next slide. <coughs> so the process to become certified as a film friendly community um, is step one is attend a workshop, which we've already done um, as a city. Um, step two is to pass enforceable filming guidelines, which, you know, <coughs> we've got with um, Chris Boone and he's looked over the sample <coughs> document that the governor sends also Sheree has. And so. Uh, we're going to make some tweaks to that in the future, but overall the document uh, does look fine. It looks like something that we can implement in the city of Beaumont and it doesn't conflict with anything that we currently do. Uh, the next step is we have to submit uh, photos of a minimum of five filming locations. And this is just for their directory. Obviously, if we're certified and they want to choose a different location, 
then locate it out of the five they can do that as well uh, but when it comes to permitting things like that we're uh, basically allowing them to see the five sites that we have already signed off on so uh, next slide from the state of texas they have this is their incentive package for productions and people who are doing films whether that's um, commercials or video games they have a minimum spend um, that they put into you know their qualification process so as you can see on my left probably you guys left as well it's it's a hundred hundred thousand dollars minimum spend in one category as you move up film and tv reality tv is 250,000 uh, and as you can see on the right side or the other column uh, you 60 percent of those uh, days that this production is going on have to be done in the state of Texas and 70 percent of the staff have to be Texas residents and so that's the incentive that's the reason that they would incentivize anyone to participate in this program because it brings about a you know a different type of economy for the city of Bowman and any other community that's certified you can go to the next slide <coughs> Uh, with something like this, you always want to look at, um, you know, your local film community. So what I did was I did some interviews with people who are do, doing local films. I reached out to Lamar University, uh, some of their filming instructors. And we, you know, with the city manager, we talked about ways to make this a win-win for both the local, uh, local filmmaking crew and also any big group that wants to choose Beaumont as a future site. And so in one column, I think we have a, us having the Natchez River historical buildings downtown Beaumont Terrell Park and it's just a list of few obviously there are other ones uh, that we can include in this list but just for the purpose of time uh, I think that those sites are attractive uh, when people are making films and uh, also our proximity to other locations geographically where we're located um, that can be included on the other side it's uh, the pricing for filmmakers you know when we are moving if we are to move forward in this process uh, we would look at a, a pricing system similar to other cities that have implemented it, a one-stop shop permitting process, so it's easier for them, and it's, uh, it matches the cost where it doesn't, we don't outprice them, where they don't feel like they're getting incentivized, and we're just incentivizing a bigger group. Uh, so like I said, we're going to streamline the process of permitting. Uh, this gives the local and smaller groups exposure to film industry, and also professional development because if you're part of this program we get certified uh, the state of Texas they have uh, webinars they have ongoing trainings they have conferences and so we'll be able to bring that information back and we'll be able to share that with the local filmmaking crew to make sure that they're um, kind of close to standards of the industry and it's a I think it's a huge development piece for them and who the people I've talked to that are local in the community, they're excited about it. They're excited about that aspect of developing the local, but also the incentive side as well, because it gives them exposure to bigger groups. Uh, next slide. Uh, the state of Texas is excited about it, obviously, because you can kind of track your ROI. So this is just from start to date. Uh, they've had about $1.9 billion of in-state spending. Uh, and you can see all those other numbers as well. I won't go through all of them, but uh, they're they're pretty excited about the project because you're able to track how much money you're making and something of this type of program, which uh, to the city of Beaumont is zero cost. We would just be merely applying. So there's no cost to us to apply for this program. Uh, next slide. You may be familiar with some of these uh, shows. These are cities that are certified. Um, Waco, Texas, obviously, uh, the Fixer Upper. My wife likes that show, and I'm pretty sure the mayor loves it, and AJ wife loves it, and I mean everybody wife probably. Loves AJ it. likes it. Yeah, AJ probably watches it. <laughs> and, and by the way, we tried to put these colors to match the Boma color, so yeah, we we tried our best. <laughs> I know it's a big thing. Uh, but as you can see in the first slide, um, the hotel occupancy tax. For Waco was a big thing. They were able to increase that occupancy rate there. So obviously that's money that's returning back to that community. Uh, you see in San Antonio over, I think, a 10-day period, they were able to see $3.5 million spent in that city. And uh, uh, Buta, Texas, which Mr. Williams obviously came from that city, uh, they have some big shows like Friday Night Lights. And, I mean, would you like to expound on that, Mr. Williams, the things that – Mr. Williams, you want to expound on Buda and 
the things you saw from this type of program. Thanks. This is your presentation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I'd add that in there. Yeah, it was uh, in 2009, Buda got certified as a film-friendly city. And, uh, you know, sometimes small changes make big differences. It's one of those small things that doesn't require much of a city. But if a production comes to your town, it gives you a lot of notoriety, a lot of attention there. So uh, they look for cities that are already on this list because they know that certain things have been already uh, vetted for them before they get there. So it, it's really uh, a good deal you know you get a large production you have hundreds of people come to your town and they're there for days and and weeks on the end doing productions and shootings so it's great it gives the small uh, filmmaker two incentives because you have to put in um, things policies and things that help them out in their production with, with using city streets and parks and uh, other facilities around town. So you already have that identified. Okay, it costs this much to close the street. It costs this much to do that. So it, it's a beneficial program. and It's been a beneficial. Um, Walker, Texas Ranger, was shot in Beauty too. So it, it was a lot of them. And, and you'll be surprised who will come to your city. And I think Spindle Top and things like that are definitely a major attraction if you're here in Beaumont. Councilmember Turner has a comment. So Beaumont was the football capital of the world, named by the NFL. So Friday Night Lights, since we didn't brought you to Beaumont, you're gonna be able to take them and bring them to Beaumont, <laughs> Get right? Friday Night Lights. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, these are some of the costs, um, or actually, the local economy would benefit from. You, some a show like Travel to the Miracle. I haven't actually seen this show. I'll admit it. But the costs are pretty attractive from a catering standpoint. You see gas that is spent in the area, lumber and supplies. And so these are, these are some of the goals that you have when you bring in a group maybe that can spend these kind of dollars. Uh, we go to the next slide. Uh, why Beaumont? Obviously, I think this gives us attention and notoriety with you know, other cities in the state of Texas. And you know, when you have a show, maybe a Hallmark can come here and that would be exciting for some of y'all to watch how I'm working in Beaumont. Uh, also, hotel tax, obviously, that's a big thing. Uh, we realize those uh, numbers. Sales tax, and these are things that we could track. So when we have a project that comes in, we know how many days they're in town. We can see if we see a spike in sales tax, hotel occupancy tax. Uh, if they hire locals, obviously, that's huge. And obviously, more visitors coming to Beaumont, Texas. Move to the next slide. So our next steps uh, is to internally work on a one-stop shop process uh, to streamline that. Um, then we'll move towards uh, getting more resources and try to perf try to get like an email list from our local film community so that this type of incentive program does professionally develop them. And so it's, in a sense, it's a win-win. Uh, we need to review our fee structure. Uh, and that's going to go with our one-stop shop process. So anybody who's wanting to do a film. I just, just touch on that real quickly. I think historically, you know, <coughs> CVB is kind of the first two we direct them to. If they want to shut down a street or something like that, it goes through, you know, PD and that kind of process. But we really haven't had a formal process. And so we get a couple requests like this a year, maybe two or three. And we again, we refer them to CVB, but there's not a formal process. And again, as Miles alluded to, we're not on the radar of the state, you know, to hopefully get uh, um, production companies here. So just, you know, thinking about the cost advantages, perhaps the tax advantages of filming in Texas, um, we think one of the benefits we have that other parts of Texas don't have is, you know, a lot of the natural beauty of the Natchez River. You know, if you, if you wanted that kind of scenery, you're not going to get that in other parts of Texas, you know, spindle top downtown so we just have a lot of advantage but to your point there hasn't really been a formal process and the idea behind this is to is to offer that so i have them call you okay definitely thank you mayor Chris. mayor pro tim durio so how long does that certification process take for aria and it would just we have we've we've completed all three steps so it's just a matter of turning it in so we've already completed them? Yeah, we've, it, the step one is the workshop. We've completed that. Step two would just be to draft up the guidelines, and we have that. Chris has already approved that from his side of things, and we have five locations 
So it's just a matter of uh, submitting our information. So, Chris, would, that, would staff have to create some type of process once we get certified? Yes, sir. We don't want to make it onerous, and, and we just want to make it structured so that we can – and again, I think part of, you know, when they've called us in the past, they'll ask, well, do you have a permit? And we said, unless you're closing down a street or something, we really don't. And you, you would think that, you know, and I think that's well received sometimes, but sometimes I think they're looking for a little structure. Um, because once they get that <coughs> approval from the city, you know, then they know, you know, if they get complaints or whatever, they can say, look, we have approval from the city. So. And I guess it just really depends on the size of the event. Like Chris said, sometimes we have people like film in the park, and it really doesn't interfere with city operations. But for large-scale production, um, there's a major event planning team that kind of involves all the major players um, that, you know, after CBB kind of assess the request, they can kind of look into maybe we need to get involved with the major event planning team that includes police, it includes um, fire, it includes, like, you know, the barricades, closing off streets and stuff like that. So it's really kind of like an assessment of need. And so I think what Miles is saying is, like, we'll have a one-stop shop to kind of help someone, <coughs> you know, kind of filter through the red tape of the city. And, like, you know, if they need a permit, if they're going to be shutting down, then it'll be one person as opposed to multiple people to deal with. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Miles and staff. It sounds like y'all done a, a very good job on bringing this to us. I appreciate it. Well, also, um, this summer um, – I met a film crew at the Blue Wave uh, car wash. Mm -hmm. They were fil filming like a school days uh, movie. So I, I believe you're on the staff is on the right track. And um, on last week, uh, the family of the Big Bopper just said they just signed a contract to do a movie about the Big Bopper who toured with, he was a local DJ tour with uh, Buddy Holly. And so I'm excited. That's good. Great news. Thank you so much for all the work. Yeah, Mary, and this, you know, like we had a permit application that you came in and you filled out and it required people to have insurance so if things happened in the city, if there were accidents, the city was covered, you know, there were certain requirements. And so, um, I'll pass this down to anybody who wants to look at it. A, a schedule of, of fee schedules, copy of fee schedules, things that people would need. And they come in and just tell you what they need, and you're able to supply it for them or get so, it to them. So once we go through the process, we get approved, we could probably post that on Yeah, it'd have to be at its own yes. website. Yeah. Yes. Great. And I'm sure it'll be a line of people. Everybody will get their 15 <laughs> minutes of fame yeah. to get a spot in one of the movies. Yeah, it's possibly a new industry, so we're excited about it. And Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Miles. Oh, thank we you. appreciate right. it. Thank you, Miles. <clears throat> okay, so Mr. City Manager, will you take us into our second uh, work session? <laughs> yes, Mayor. Uh, work session. <clears throat> Review and discuss amending the Code of Ordinances related to various health department requirements and fees. <clears throat> It's been a long day. It's That's okay. Long. We're at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we just coming before you. I have Justin Jackson with me, who's the environmental health manager. Uh, and some of this stuff that's in here is just we're kind of cleaning it up. It's already in place. Uh, but we're just coming for a review session to adopt the proposed changes to our food code as well as adopting the state 2021 Texas food establishment rules. Right now, currently in the uh, ordinance, it says that the, the inspection report has to be posted just in the restaurant or the consumer can ask to see it upon request. But what we're proposing, and hopefully you guys would agree, we actually want the health inspection report um, at the entrance of the facility. And Justin did his research and looked around the state in San Antonio. Where they put it on the door as you enter the restaurant. Okay. So uh, that's what we're proposing that you allow us to, to do that, where every restaurant would have to post their score as well as the inspection report upon the entrance of the restaurant. Next slide. Well, question. Yes, sir. So, 
like exactly where? Like on the door or yes. on the outside of the restaurant? No, on the inside. So what if your restaurant doesn't have... And then we'll, we'll work through that with the restaurant, depending on how the restaurant is, <coughs> is uh, built. But we want it where when the consumer goes to the restaurant, they'd be able to see the inspection report as well as the, the, uh, the grade. Because now they can, you know, sometimes they'll post it in the kitchen, right? And as a consumer, you, you don't look for it. But even though you have a right to ask for it, but we just want it where it be visible to, to everyone. Okay. So basically the front entrance. Yes. Got you. And, and Kenneth, you may not have this information readily at hand, but uh, how, how often does restaurants get inspected? Do we here in Beaumont? Is it per the ordinance? They have to get inspected at least twice a year. Okay. Regular inspection, but of course, if there's a complaint, then that complaint takes priority. Okay. The next slide is the reporting or the scoring. Uh, you know the old, the way it's done now: superior rating, hundred to eighty; above average rating. As you can see, above average and superior is the same rating. Average is 79 and below, but what we're proposing <coughs> is that the scoring system be 100 to a 90 would be a letter A grade, as we do in school. 89 to 80 would be a B. 79 to 70 is a C. And anything below 70 will require, excuse me, immediate closure and follow-up inspection. Question. Mm -hmm. Why... Do we have superior rating and above average rating the same currently? Well, that type was an old one. That's why we're proposing to change it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So everything in red is from the old ordinance. Yes. So like that's been there for I don't know how many years. And so that's why we're proposing to change it. Uh, and to get what brother, uh, brother. <laughs> Councilmember A.J. Turner was saying that last one, display at the interest of the food establishment. And so we're looking now, as you can see, that's in the red. It's superior rating. So that's what the placard reads, superior. But what we're proposing that if they have a 98, this would be on the front entrance. So it would be a letter grade. And so that's what we're proposing. So you would do the number and the letter? Yes, Just as like well that? as the inspection report. Yes, ma'am. Next slide. Now, the city of Beaumont used to uh, offer the food managers program, and that was through the state of Texas. But that program no longer exists. So now they take a test through the uh, it's a national database that Texas has approved. And so we just, again, proposing that the certified food manager is one who has shown proficiency of required information through passing a department-approved examination prior to opening of a food establishment. Now, if you can look in the red that's crossed out, and the way it reads now, um, a person was allowed to open up a restaurant, operate in a restaurant, and they have up to 90 days before they become a certified food manager. And what we're proposing is that they become a certified food manager before they open. Question, anybody, everybody good? Yes, sir. Is what taking place? Uh, you guys are making this provision, and what's eventually happening? And they're not completing it within the ninety days. Is this a way to kind of avoid that? Well, it's all about food safety for us, and the whole idea behind the, uh, the food managers program it teaches food safety. And the way it reads now, that for example, I can open up a <laughs> restaurant and not have my certified food manager, but it allows me ninety days. So that's three months. So, but if I don't know about food safety, that's a lot of people who potentially can get sick within those 90 days. Yes. So we're proposing that I will have my certified food manager certificate prior to me being able to operate a restaurant. Yes, sir. So 
what happens if you make this change and the restaurant has a certified food manager and they leave and they have to they have to stop right there because they don't have somebody else certified as a food protection manager or do they get some period we'll, of time we'll allow them some time we'll allow them some time we're mm -hmm. just not going to close them down right then and there <coughs> but what we do encourage through the restaurant we deal with the uh, the owner of the restaurant, not just the manager, is that it, it's <coughs> ideal to have more than one person as a certified food manager <coughs> because a certification, it, it certifies the person, and it doesn't necessarily certifies the restaurant. So if I'm a certified food manager for, uh, let's say, Chick-fil-A, and I lead, my certification follows me. It doesn't stay with Chick-fil-A. And so that's why we're always encouraging the restaurant to have more than one. Because that happens all the time. When you say you work with them. We'll allow them some time. Okay, see, here's the problem I have. That can be arbitrary when you say you're going to work with them. You know, it, it's like, well, what does that actually mean? You're going to work with them. How, many, how much time do they have? Should that be put forth in the code or just left to your discretion? Or how is that going to work? Typically, we. So, in the Texas food establishment rules, you're supposed to have a certified food manager for every shift. So, let's say, for example, Chick fil A, just as you mentioned them, they usually have on one shift like three to four. So, if one person leaves, they still usually have one or still three or four. So, that's the person, let's say, for example, you were receiving food. That's the person that's supposed to make sure that the food that you're receiving is not damaged or received hot or just in bad condition. So um, as far as working with them, um, let's say, for example, I go, I go out there, we give them maybe at the most a week to 10 days. But most times and almost 100 percent of the time, they have more than one certified food manager at all times i'm kind of thinking of like mom and pop operations like uh, mr burger over on east lucas uh you know it's pretty much a family operation i don't know that i don't know how many food protection managers they have but you, you know how, i understand when you have a big corporate franchise and you know but there's a difference between your smaller home operations I what, think, do you, what, what do you mean difference? Well, there, there's there's a difference in financial ability to have multiple food service managers. Yeah, uh, that that may be the case. But again, the whole idea behind the, the certified food manager program is food safety. Okay. And we need to ensure that everyone that's working at that establishment uh, has taken a course in food safety. Mr. Coleman, how strenuous is it to acquire the certified food manager licensing? Or is, it, is it a, a long process? Is it a simple one? I think that would help clarify some of these questions. Now it's online. Okay. So you can do it from the convenience of your home. It's online, and we give them the website. Uh, There's different sites they can choose from, uh, and so they can do it at, at their own convenience. It's online. Thank what, you. What's the fee for that? It, there's different companies, but it, let's say, for example, if you had a certified food manager certification before and it expired, there's some companies you could just do it um, for $35, just retake the test, and it'll be um, good for five years. Okay. Any other questions over this slide? Next slide. And so this is kind of continuations. And that website, that link, is, is what we give them to go to to, uh, to take the approved uh, certification course. And like Justin was saying, it's good for five years. When the city of Beaumont was offering the course, it was only good for three years. But it was only good for the city of Beaumont. It didn't follow you if you left the city of Beaumont. So this one is national. <coughs> and so wherever you go, it follows you. And it's good for five years. 
How much is that one? This it's it ranges as Justin stated. If you're just doing a renewal, some companies be thirty five dollars. The most it would be would be a hundred. That would be the most from any company. And that varies from city to city, or no, this is a national. It's, oh, yeah, okay. it varies from company to company that offers the test. Next slide. And again, this is just to talking about the food managers course. Next slide, Tina. Okay, these are the fees. And we haven't, I've been in public health for 31 years. And I don't think we've ever changed the fees. And if you've noticed, some of our fees have cents attached to it. So we're proposing changing some of the fees and dropping the cents and just making a flat rate instead. So, Tina, if you can, okay. As you can see, currently right now, our annual food permit for a, a restaurant, uh, zero to 10 stews is 192.50. Uh, and we compared it to the city of Port Arthur, Waco, McLennan County, and the city of Baytown. And so what we're proposing is to reduce the amount from 192.50 to 150 for uh, restaurants with zero to 10 stews. Hmm? Yeah, and 11 to 20, we're proposing to increase from $203.50 to a flat rate of 225. And as you can see, you can compare to the other cities that's comparable to our size and their fees. Next slide, team. Uh, 21 to 30 stews, we're proposing to go from $214.50 to $250. And 31 to 50 stews, we're proposing to go from $225.50 to a flat rate of $275. Next slide. 51 to 75 stews, uh, we're proposing taking it from $236.50 to $300. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What, what did y'all base that on? I mean, how did you come up to go? I mean, did you do it percentage-wise or? We're just looking at other cities. Just That's in comp comparison yeah. to other cities. Yes. See, but as you can see, Waco and McLennan, they, you know, some cities do the number of stews or the number of chairs. Some cities do the number of people that are actually working in the restaurant. And some cities based there, like Waco McLennan, on the square feet of the building. So each city does it different on how they uh, set their fee. But we're just trying to be comparable to uh, cities our size. And the fact that we have not raised our fees in, I don't know, 20 plus years. Why, why does the city of Port Arthur and city of Baytown have nothing with uh, 51 to 75 stools? as far as they went like yeah if we, go, if we go to the previous slide that's yeah. as far as they they just cut it off at, at 31 to 50 stews uh pulled off and cut theirs off at 21 to 30 stews okay one more okay 76 to 100 stews we want we were proposing from $247.50 to a flat rate of $325 and 101 to 150 stews, $258.50 to $350 flat rate. And uh, I think we got one more. That's it. And so uh, that's what we're proposing with the fees. Any question over the fees? So if you're at a restaurant that has stools and chairs, which one you count? They still the same. They count the same. They all count the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They all count the same. All right. Next slide. All right. This is temporary permits, <coughs> and currently, right now, for the city of Beaumont, you'll get a temporary permit. It's a flat rate of thirty-three dollars, but that permit is good for fourteen days. And as you can see, city of Port Arthur is thirty dollars per day. City of Baytown is $30 per day. What we're proposing is $30 per day with a max of 14 days. 
because 100% of the time now when somebody get a temporary permit, even though it's for 14 days, they only use it for one day. They don't use the other 13 days. They only use it for one day. So we're proposing to a flat rate of $30 per day with a max of 14 days for a temporary. So this could be like a link sale, like Boy Scouts doing? Yes. Because right now they'll pay $33. But the permit is good for 14 days. But typically, 99% of the people are going to only operate on that one day. So what's the purpose of even proposing to extend it for 14 days? No, we're saying you a permit is up to 14. You can get it for 14 consecutive days. You just have to pay $30 times 14. That's oh. what we're proposing. Oh. Okay. Um, All right. In the city of Noel, well, let me, Justin corrected me. Because in the red, the city of Beaumont, each additional day of a temporary permit is a $15 fee would be charged. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay. Stand to be corrected. Yes, sir. Just per day, 14 day max. But they're going to be charged per day, whether it's two days, five days, 12 days, 13 days, right? Mm -hmm. So why do we care if they go past 14 as long as they keep paying? Um, in, the, in the food code, the temporary permit um, is for 14 days. So it, it says that in the actual food code that like if we, the guidance for temporary permits is, is the max for 14 days because it's not – a link sale is not – supposed to turn into an outside restaurant basically yeah okay yeah I get it <coughs> hey, current mobile food unit fees currently right now to for a mobile food unit which is a food truck they pay a flat rate of 192.50 and what we're proposing is that food trucks that's considered low risk are selling what's considered low risk and we have an example at the bottom snow cones and ice cream we're proposing for a low risk that they pay a hundred dollars and your high risk that sells the meat or food that's potentially hazardous we propose into the, the they uh fee be 250 dollars is this per day it's per annual. or annual? It's annual. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's annual. And as you can see, some other cities like Baytown is extremely high. They 300 so for high risk. So what determines? What it, determines it, low and high risk? A low risk would be a snow cone truck. Uh, high risk, Mabel's. if you want to sell brisket. So... <clears throat> All right, uh, mobile food units. Uh, as you can see in the old ordinance, it says you needed a food sale permit, uh, but the food sale permit can be eliminated since we already have a mobile food unit permit. Um, currently, mobile food units are barred from preparation of any food that requires extensive rinsing, such as crawfish, because their wastewater tank is limited in size. Uh, but we know this area is real big on crawfish. And so what we're proposing is that to allow mobile units to sell crawfish, providing that they purge and do their rinsing at their commissary. Because the wastewater tank on the mobile food truck is not doesn't have that capacity. But if they do all their rinsing, do all their purging at their commissary, and just have the crawfish on the truck and boil it, then that's what we're proposing to allow them to do. Because currently, right now, they can't even do that. I have a question. Going back to that food sale permit, uh -huh. the way it reads now, no. No, no the yeah. next one, team. The one that was on. <coughs> nah, go forward. Oh. Yeah. That one. It said that uh, a permit issued to a mobile food unit owner that's a food truck allowing operation of the unit for a maximum of 72 hours and limited to two permits per month. 
So are we doing away with that limitation of two permits per month? Right, because a mobile food unit permit is annual. It's a year. One a year. You get permitted once a year. So this is going to make it easier for food trucks? Yeah, yes. More okay. Yes. Mayor, you had a question about the crawfish. Do you have any? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're proposing, allowing mobile food units. Next slide, Tina. Uh, mobile food units, commissary, central prep area. Currently, right now, the way the ordinance reads is that all mobile food establishments shall move and vacate the premise of the business location on a daily base, basis. Overnight parking at the business location is prohibited. At the end of each business day, the mobile food establishment shall return to the central preparation facility, commissary for servicing and storage. If storage is not allowed at the central preparation facility, commissary, the mobile food unit must be stored in a secure storage facility. And then we put in what's the definition <coughs> of a secure storage facility. Now, we be getting a lot of pushback on that, but as you can see, that's highlighted in <coughs> green, this is in the state food code. And it reads, mobile food unit provisions except as otherwise provided in this paragraph and in paragraph two of this subsection the regulatory authority may impose additional requirements to protect against health hazards related to the conduct of food establishments as a mobile operation next slide team wait 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 go ahead wait. um what is the end of a business day because i see food trucks operating along college 10 o'clock at night. Three. We don't give them a time to operate. It's that long as it's operational. In other words, they are now, they're not allowed to stay at that site if they're not operating. Okay. Um, how do we enforce that? Because I think all of us know that there's food trucks that aren't being moved on a daily basis. And we, we, ask, we ask citizens to report it to us. Uh, because we, we do, we are aware of that. And, and then we, we go out, we, we do our investigations, we do, uh, you know, every, every now and then we'll do a, a Saturday run, a Saturday evening run, just to ensure that people are following the rules. Where in, the gr where in this green does it require mobile food units to leave each day? It's on the next slide. Okay. Next slide. Okay. That uh, the second bullet per 2021 Texas establishment rules, a mobile food unit shall operate from a central preparation facility or other fixed food establishment and shall report to such location daily for supplies, cleaning, and servicing operations. And the reason behind that is when you allow mobile food units to stay stationary, a lot of times what happens, they dump that wastewater in the city drain. And we have evidence of that because you can tell how the grass look. The grass is going to turn brown. <coughs> and then speaking with the people from the water department, that, that grease and that water get into the sewer system, it can solidify and it can cause damage to the city sewer system. And so that's the whole idea by having them report back to the uh, central prep area because that area, that fixed establishment, has a grease trap. So when they dump their wastewater, then uh, it's safer that way. And that's why we, uh, so we're just following the state rule. All foods must be stored at an approved commissary accompanied by a sign affidavit or be purchased daily and accompanied by receipts. Question. Yeah, um, I think we've had in the past, and I know I've had meetings with you and vendors, Mr. Coleman, some of the foods that are sold at food trucks when it says be purchased daily and accompanied by receipts 
the food itself requires prep time so much so that you you can't purchase it daily because the grocery stores aren't open and it requires so much prep time that if they wait till the grocery stores open in the morning they won't have the ability to prep it and sell it that same day so how does that work they have an option if you go back up to number one it can be stored for example if you selling brisket right and you need to prep it and you have your special marinade and all that you can do that at your commissary leave it at your commissary and then the next morning go get it and then you can cook it and the whole idea behind that is it's again it's about the health and the safety of the community that we cannot allow you to store your food at home we cannot allow you to prep your food at home. And so if you don't have a commissary that will allow you space <coughs> to prep your food, then that's when you have to purchase it daily accompanied by receipts because that's ensure us that the food is fresh. You purchase it from an uh, approved food source. I, I got a question. Do we do we? As a city, it's not. I know it's not our responsibility to say who provides commissary. But right. as a convenience, due to the fact that we have this many food trucks, is there any kind of way that we can kind of work with or uh, uh, have a list of people who have commissary options to sign up to? We, we do. Them we, to? we meet with our food truck vendors uh, quarterly. Mm -hmm. And the last meeting we had, that it was a gentleman in there that you know had information saying he was a commissary. Um, and so that happens. Okay. Uh, the food truck vendors pretty much know in the city who's a commissary and who's not. They, they pretty much know now. They have to make that arrangement. They have to make that agreement. I don't know what cost is involved uh, with that. Uh, but again, you know, our job as public health, I have to ensure that what you're selling is safe for the consumer to consume. Okay. And and so these rules that we're proposing uh, not only protects the consumer but it also protects the vendor because uh, I'm sure no one's in the business of making people sick. Approximately how many food trucks are there currently operating in Beaumont? Uh, I actually have my iPad in front of me so I could pull it up for you because we have a lot of a lot of people coming and going at the moment so let's see i say roughly around 63 but i can i can give you a definite answer wow that's a lot, a lot more than and do we have enough commissaries to accommodate that number of trucks do we have enough yes, yes. <coughs> there's enough commissaries in the city okay uh because you just have to be a fixed food establishment you just okay. have to be a restaurant to become a commissary okay I think the bigger problem, Randy, is it not the commissary, it's just the relationships that the food <coughs> truck drivers have to get access to them. So I think that's what could be a disconnect. Uh, it's, a it's a total of 63, but that includes yeah. uh, ice cream trucks and snow cone trucks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what the disconnect is, just the food trucks actually having access to, to the commissary. Yeah, to a fixed they restaurant. Receive them as competition. Exactly. Why would I help you, would I help you yeah. store your food? I, in, in, in my opinion, what has happened with, with mobile food trucks, um, because when you think of a mobile food truck, they're not allowed to have tables and chairs set up, right? It's in the ordinance. It's yeah. supposed to be to go. You know, it's mobile. You've you got to get your food and go. Uh, because when you start setting up tables and chairs, now you operate like a, like a fixed establishment. And what has happened that I see is that a lot of these mobile food trucks get into the business of uh, preparing and selling quick food. Then they want to move up to selling this food that takes a long prep time. And that's where they start running into trouble. <coughs> because it's very difficult to want to sell brisket, but your recipe calls for your brisket to be marinated for 100 hours. And you don't have a commissary 
that allows you that that space to prep your food as well as to store it right and so we can allow you to to prepare that food and store it at your home if i may i think the bigger thing is that we don't inspect home kitchens and so we can't go into people's personal homes to inspect and so there's no way to know if they're storing meat next to spooled or sour objects next to bleach if there's animals around if the if the space is sanitary and if they're they're you know prepping food in accordance that is something that you can do in a commissary because that's a commercial kitchen that's been permitted and viewed it's going to get a health grade and all those things and so that the bigger thing is that we just can't regulate what happens in people's personal homes right and the biggest thing with food is time and time <coughs> do they have the capacity at their home to store the food and keep it at the right temperature so one of the questions i have the talking about the uh, these mobile food units having to return back to their base every night mm -hmm. so and this is all based on the texas food establishment yes and that's texas code right yes so how do places like like austin for example they have these food truck parks and you know these food trucks do not move every night i mean they got landscape around them now you can you can designate a food truck park and they'll be allowed, but they still need to go back to their commissary to service, to dump their wastewater. But these food trucks in Austin, they don't ever move. Wow. But they may have the, the they may have the they ability have, to dump their wastewater right. there at the at the. Uh, it depends on what's set up at park. the food truck park. Is there a, a commissary located by the food truck park? Uh, does Austin have something arranged where someone come by, a company comes by, and you know? Take up the wastewater? I don't know. I'm not familiar with, with Austin. Well, Taylor, uh, I know the city of Waco actually does provide a commissary as well as dumping for their food truck part. So, I mean, I think that's something that we can also look into. What can we do to help some of these food trucks? Because some of these cities do provide all of that. But, in fact, it's Mr. Coleman. That's what some the council would have to decide, yeah, not I, the yeah. so, health department. Like, what about the fair? They don't move every night. They dump at Ford Park. There's grease traps at Ford Park. So there, there's a hose from the food truck that goes directly to the grease trap. <coughs> so this is a special, it's, it's basically a big temporary permit. But there's ways to get water and dispose of the waste at the location. Okay. But where do they prep the food for the commissary? Because they, where do they do that? They have to buy it. Yeah. They, um, so the fair, just like any fair around, in, they have people that deliver the food to them. So as as far as the fair goes, is that's why most of the people just have little fast finger food, unless you have somebody that does like shish kebabs, but they do it all on site. Now, the city does provide that service for dumping the wastewater uh, during Mardi Gras to the food truck vendors that set up at Mardi Gras. I mean, it could be done, but that's, that's for a council to decide if, if you want to uh, venture out to uh, setting up a commissary that the city runs. I mean. Well, uh, I'm trying to understand, like, kebabs at mm -hmm. the fair. Uh, it, I'm reading this. It says, must be stored at an approved commissary accompanied by a signed affidavit or be purchased daily and accompanied by receipts. Mm -hmm. So which one do they do? So they, they buy, so let's say, for example, the fair starts on a Thursday. They buy their food either that Tuesday because they have freezers there. They buy their Tuesday. The freezers are where? Out at the fairground. At the fairground. Okay. Right. They they either buy that Tuesday and we come check everything, a company with receipts, mm -hmm. and they can do their prep that day, and just put it in their freezer until that the fair actually starts. It. Next slide, Miss Tina. <laughs> All right, temporary food permits, uh, special event permit. 
The current ordinance does not have a hard deadline for special events. And the special event permit is when you have six or more vendors. And what we're proposing is that that if you're gonna hold a special event, that you apply for your permit at least 30 days prior to your event. And the reason for that is, is typically it's, it's on a Saturday, uh, but we have other organizations that also apply for a temporary permit. And so when you apply for a temporary permit, is that you apply for it, but you don't get issued your permit until the inspector goes out and inspect your setup. That's when you actually issued your permit. And so, so we're asking people, if you're going to hold a special event and you have six or more trucks, we're ask, we asking that you apply 30 days in advance so we can put those time slots. And that's what we're proposing for a uh, special event and temporary. As well as just for uh, application for temporary, uh, currently there's uh, no set time, but we're asking people to uh, at least seven days because what was happening in the past, everybody wants a temporary for a Saturday and everybody's coming in Friday applying for the permit. All right? And so, and everybody wants, their, wants the inspection done at the same time. And that's impossible. And so we're just encouraging people to apply for it. And if you know you're going to do something six months from now, you can apply for it now. And then now you, you got the opportunity to get the, the time you really want because we let them choose the time. If you come in and say, hey, I'm going to be ready for 8 o'clock, and if that time slot is open, we'll put you down for 8. So you can schedule it. Yeah, you can right. schedule it. And so that's what we're proposing. And of course, with temporary permits, the food products must be purchased with receipts on the day of the temporary permit event. And this is just some adopted terms and uh, definitions that's in the 2021 food code. Um, but I want to focus your attention on that last bullet. Uh, each temporary establishment may be required by the regulatory authority and in the ordinance that's the public health director to have at least one person on site with a minimum of an accredited food handler certification. Can I ask a question on that one? Mm -hmm. So back to the comment Councilmember Getz made about Boy Scouts selling links or something. Mm -hmm. So somebody would have to have this certification? Yeah, that's a, it's a $9 course. And but it's, it's like, we're going to go stand in front of M&D and cook links, and somebody's going to have to have this? Yeah, because it's about food safety. The food handlers course is still teaches you about food safety. So when the folks have those fundraisers, like, Behind a liquor store on Fourth and Washington. <laughs> 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 Not a lot of places. <laughs> they supposed to have this too? <laughs> well, if, if you guys. Uh, yeah. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what we're proposing that you you <laughs> adopt because, again, it's <laughs> about food safety. I thought, I thought most of this stuff is like this already. And we just no. read what we asked it's, it's about food safety. How long is the food handler course once you take it and get two the certificate? Two years. Okay. So it's like $9 and you $9. cover it for and two years. You do years. it online and you get a certificate and it's good for two years. Right. So, Justin, when we go out to, like you said, the Little League link sales, are we yeah, checking to see? Question. Yeah, are we checking to see if someone actually has this food handler license? What happens if they don't? Do, does they fundraiser that they've been marketing and planning for get shut down? So before we ever go out, we call. Now, we're not telling the Little League kid to have the food handling certification. It could be the parent there watching because the parent's going to be there watching anyway. Just as long as somebody on site is certified because it teaches food safety. The number one thing for a foodborne illness is, is really – it's the person that's handling the food, and secondly, cross-contamination. If you don't know how to handle the food safely, then it puts everybody at risk. So 
Didn't we do you redo this every year? It seems like this is all familiar and we just went over. Well, you know, we over. came we came to you guys uh November twenty one. Uh but you know, a lot of things happened since then. Right, and so since so much time has lapsed, uh, we thought it'd be great, uh, be a good idea to come back as a discussion item once again, as opposed to asking you guys to come and vote on it. So, well, aren't we going to eventually have to vote on this? Yes, sir. Okay. Any any other questions? I have one. Let's just say, for instance, you have a business owner and their partners, and one decides to end the partnership, and he has the LLC, and he wants to transfer this $300 fee for a larger restaurant to another restaurant. Would he have to pay all over again? Would he be able to transfer the existing one? Follow him. I mean, he already paid for the year, and it's under the LLC, Give so would he example. have to pay it? Uh, let's just say... <laughs> <laughs> and I hate to use no, my no boy's names. restaurant. Let's let's say we won't. We'll make up a restaurant. You and Councilmember Guest is in business. Me and Councilmember <laughs> Guest is in business. Right. I find him stealing. All right, and <laughs> and, and, and I I want to end the partnership. But right. the LLC we already paid for it. Councilmember Guest may be just the investor. He don't want to continue to operate with the restaurant. I already paid the fee for the year. I want to move to another location and continue doing business. Would I have to pay the fee all over again if I've already paid it for that particular year? Yes. Short but also there's yes. a but also there's a legal reason for that. Y'all yeah, yeah. have y'all have some things y'all haven't worked out. And so if Councilman Getz wants to dispute you taking the LLC because he's an investor and he wants some proprietary stuff, it's different. The better question is y'all have dissolved all legal disputes. And now you want to train, and you gained rights to the LLC with your settlement in the lawsuit. Do you then, in the creation of your new establishment, have to restart over the process? And the answer is still going to be yes. Yes, <laughs> because it goes because with the, the permit. It follows with it. It stays with the site. Yeah, it stays with the site. Guess what? Rumor is going to get twisted on social media. <laughs> and me and get stealing money from. <laughs> <laughs> and and my, my last question is man, the liquor renewal is so much more high than these fee, fee, these food renewals. Is it? I, I don't know if this is off base, but is it a reason that you're paying almost triple the amount with a liquor renewal versus the food renewal? Profit margin. But still, you make more money with food, so it's not logical. <laughs> it's two different <laughs> regulators. That's the TCA or you know TABC. Texas Commission of Alcohol. Yeah, you got me. TABC. It's it's after five. Y'all know it's close to six o'clock. I'm usually in bed, but it's uh it's it's the the liquor commission. They have their own setting, and so our ordinance is in line with with that as well. All of our ordinance try to align with state law to make sure we're in compliance. So if there's a differentiation in free fees, that's typically why. And churches on Saturday morning, men's prayer breakfast, pancakes, bacon for the public. For the public? Well, you open it up to your parishioners and your public, but you're not selling. How does that work? Oh, shoot. I was trying to say give it away. <laughs> Some questions shouldn't even be asked. <laughs> I don't. Nobody can. So it doesn't make a distinction between yeah. selling and, and well, giving away food. If, if you only it's a consumption of food and the preparation yeah. of food. You have to have a temporary permit if you open it up to the general public. Anybody can come in and get breakfast. Yeah, we but advertise it on social to, media. It says we got a men's prayer breakfast, pancakes, biscuits. Right. You know, anybody could walk in. And, and, and if, uh, if your kitchen is not a certified kitchen. If your kitchen, if church your, kitchens I've been in if your church kitchen is a certified and kitchen and, and everything. then you don't need to get a temporary permit because your kitchen is certified as long as you have a certified food manager present 90 percent of churches don't have that what and, and no, I, no 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 that's not true that's not true that's not true church I'm talking about some of the, well yeah the larger churches I'm thinking the little small churches that don't no, they have kitchen ministries. Okay. And they cook. And that's some yeah. of the best foods you can eat. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. At that Baptist yeah. church. Most, Baptist most churches they, that, that, you know, that has a kitchen, 
It's certified. Yeah. Well, I know mine is. I yeah. have, but I mean, I'm just saying. I'm thinking of smaller churches that don't have, uh, you know, they, they're had the same. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So it, it's it's the same rule though. Yes. Just because you're giving it away, it doesn't matter. It's the consumption and the preparation. Yeah. Now the benefit of the church, they they permit is half price. Say that again. They permit is half price. Oh, they don't pay the, the full church. price. The church. Yeah. Well. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's still about food safety, uh, Councilmember Phil Shaw. Oh, I hear you. I have staff. I know we say grace over it, but it's still about food safety. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, another um, question we always get about the commissary. And currently in the ordinance, it's uh, the commissary has to be within the city limits of Beaumont. Because the inspector can go outside of the, their jurisdiction and inspect another restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's required that all commissaries be within the city limits of Beaumont. Okay, so that brings up another question. So what do you do for Mardi Gras when you get these vendors that come in from Houston? They have to get a permit. They, I mean, they, they fall under Mardi Gras permit because Mardi Gras gets a special event permit. Tell me when I'm wrong, Justin. And but we still go out and inspect each truck. But their base commissary is not here. But but they have to buy their product fresh. Daily. With Daily. the receipt. Now a food truck can come from Houston. They have to come in and get a temporary permit, even though they're permitted in Houston. But they have to come in and get a temporary permit. And if they don't have a commissary within the city limits of Beaumont with a signed affidavit, then they have to buy their product fresh the day of. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Man, y'all calling out people. Mr. Coleman, thank you so very much for your presentation. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. So we'll, uh, we'll be coming back to you guys for... For a vote. For a vote, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Okay, now's the time for council member comment, and I will start with you, Mayor Pro Tem Durio. No comment. Council member Getz. I just want to say how enjoyable it was to participate in the uh, soft opening and grand opening of main event. It's a uh, a new facility here in Beaumont it's uh, like Dave and Buster's it's a great place for uh, kids of all ages to go enjoy themselves and uh, can't say that there's nothing to do in Beaumont now thank you councilmember Turner no comment councilmember Felshaw no comment councilmember Samuel no comment councilmember Neal I just want to tell Tina that you and your family have been in our prayers. Yes. And our city manager. And uh, just be sure, now you get a departmental work status report. This is a report on every department in the city of Beaumont. You get this every month now. It's a great reference source. You have a question about what's going on in departments, this is your book your constitution bible and in regards to what's going on you, you you can get the binder or you can get electronically oh. yeah thank you mr williams mm -hmm. <clears throat> city attorney great tina prayers to you and your family also would like to say happy founders day to the mothers of jack and jill of america they're celebrating their 84 <coughs> years um locally we have a chapter here who's been in existence for 21 years and they've done amazing work with our youth and engagement here locally so just wanted to send that out thank you mr boone mr barkoviak it's dark now and there were still underpasses that were flooded so Stay safe, watch for the barricades. Don't drive into any water, please. Okay, and again, I would like to say um, condolences, Tina, to you and your family and the loss of your mother. We've been praying for you and we'll be there for you on Saturday. 
and also um, on Friday um, I had a blast at the main event ribbon cutting and um, council member gets as soon as you walked out you probably were not even at the door they brought the scissors out to walk up but council but member the scissors oh. the scissors for uh, the ribbon cutting and then on uh, what Wednesday Thursday night uh, last week um, we were able to go out and bring our families um, it is amazing so if you haven't been out again like council member guest says you can't say it's nowhere for the kids and the youth to go we look forward to hopefully opening many many more facilities uh, like that and we are going to recess the executive session. Thank you for joining us. Be safe. The underpasses have water, so please avoid all underpasses. And thanks for coming, and go out and spread the love. Thank you.